President, Sri Lanka Medical Association, Dr. Vinya Ariratna, to brief you about the objectives of these regional clinical meetings, as well as our efforts of Sri Lanka Medical Association towards updating the knowledge and skills of regional medical as well as public health colleagues. So over to you. Thank you. <coughs> That is actually our assistant uh, secretary, Dr. Lahiru Kodituak, who is working uh, at the Dengu unit of the Ministry of Health. Good morning. Uh, Vice Chancellor of the Eastern University, Professor V. Kanagasingham, uh, Batical, Batiklo Medical Association pr uh, President, uh, Dr. S. Uh, Branavan, uh, Deputy Director of Teaching Hospital Batiklo, Dr. Mrs. Uh, Bartlett, and RDHS Batiklo, uh, Dr. J. Sukunan. Dr. K.T. Sundaresan, uh, who is the council member of SLMA as well, and consultant physician at Teaching Hospital Batiklo, and uh, Dr. Livington, secretary, Batiklo Medical Association, and all the other uh, distinguished uh, invitees and resource persons for this important joint regional meeting of Sri Lanka Medical Association and the um, Batiklo Medical Association uh, in partnership with the Regional Directorate of Health health services in Batiklo. Uh, all the participating doctors and our uh, nurses and other uh, medical staff who are connected to teaching hospital Batiklo. So I am indeed uh, very pleased and honored to be attending this event today, which is the second regional meeting of the Sri Lanka Medical Association that we are having two years after, three years after not being able to have physical meetings. I am the president of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. My background is in community medicine. I am a consultant community physician who has been in the uh, academia and in, and in the uh, government sector as well as in the non-governmental sector for the last 20, 25 years. So it is a great pleasure for me to return to Batiklo, uh, to this hall. And I was invited uh, by uh, uh, our uh, doctor, um, um, uh, our consultant, uh, uh, psychiatrist, Dr. Gadambanadan, sorry, I'm going to talk. Dr. Gadambanadan, uh, about 10 years ago, as one of the uh, uh, guest speakers. Uh, so, uh, sorry, Dr. Gadambanadan, I couldn't uh, um, uh, acknowledge your presence as well. So, uh, that time also, I was very much uh, uh, promoting this concept of partnerships and also uh, uh, the uh, importance of preventive aspects of uh, medicine coming of, of course from a preventive uh, medicine background. So um, let me just uh, take a few minutes uh, to uh, uh, highlight from the <coughs> objectives of the Sri Lanka Medical Association and um, um, our theme for this year. Um, so the theme, as it was mentioned by Dr. Uh, Kuditu Akku, is towards human health care, excellence, equity, and community. So Sri Lanka Medical Association has a very long history. It was established as the Ceylon branch of the British Medical Association in 1887. And then, uh, of course, it evolved to become the Sri Lanka Medical Association today with uh, an active membership of about 4,500. And I invite those of you who are not members of the Sri Lanka Medical Association to obtain the membership as well, because we have some very uh, exciting and important uh, um, events as well as uh, also professional uh, um, uh, opportunities for you to enhance your knowledge and skills in, in the medical profession. So we would like to lead the medical community to achieve the highest standards of medical professionalism and ethical conduct and also to be an advisory body on health policy to the Sri Lankan government and the community. So last three months particularly as you all know better than myself because you are 
all of you are at the front line of providing clinical health care, uh, the constraints within which we have to operate as medical uh, service providers. There is a shortage of medicines and there are also uh, various associated problems for the patients to even access um, medical services and also for our own health staff to be able to perform uh, and also come to work and all those things. So uh, we have been trying to influence the government policies in terms of how to um, work in a situation of resource constraints, how to provide optimum service and also engaging with the community. So uh, from the beginning of this year, we have been engaged in various activities that we wanted to promote towards our theme, which I will come to in a minute. So we have also core values for our organization, starting from accountability, we have to play an advocacy role, and we collaborate. That's why in this joint clinical meeting, we are collaborating with the Batiklo uh, Directorate of Health Services, as well as the uh, Batiklo Medical Association, and then diversity. Our council, I'm very proud to say, reflect the diversity of this country in terms of ethnicity, in terms of religion, in terms of the subspecialties of medicine. So I'm very proud that uh, we are carrying on that tradition of being truly a Sri Lankan professional organization that can work together across div uh, divides that have also led us to a uh, lot of violence in this country. Then integrity. I think we have to remind ourselves of the importance of maintaining our integrity, not going after politicians or got not being corrupted by this corrupt system of governance. So as professionals, we try to promote integrity, particularly among the doctors in Sri Lanka. We have to give leadership. We have to give leadership to the prop medical, not only the pr medical professional, but profession, but also to our community. And there's a social responsibility for us. We are working across different disciplines. That's why the vice chancellor is here, who has been a champion of peace and reconciliation in Sri Lanka. We have worked with him together in my work previously with Sarvo there. So it's, it's a great pleasure for us to now engage with you all today, and we have different mechanisms and activities uh, within SLMA to promote. We have expert committees and link committees and subcommittees in different uh, specialities. We conduct the annual International Medical Congress, which will be held in July, from July 25th to the 29th. So I invite all of you, uh, those of you who are doing research and also having experience to come forward and submit abstracts for our, our sessions, and it will be a good opportunity for the young physicians, young doctors here, uh, who are interested in sharing your experience as well as you can join other sessions and gain your, uh, uh, Im improve your knowledge as well. Then we have foundation sessions. I'm proud to announce that our foundation sessions this year will be held in Jaffna. Uh, uh, our vice president, uh, Dr. Surendran Kumaran, is the uh, dean of Jaffna Medical Faculty, so he will be organizing uh, the foundation sessions in Jaffna for the first time. So we are very happy that we will be uh, doing our events throughout Sri Lanka. Uh, then we have uh, what we call the monthly clinical meetings. All these meetings, even though you are based in Batiklo, you can access. Uh, and we, uh, if you go to uh, uh, SLMA website, you will get the schedule. And even this, this meeting is uh, uh, being uh, uh, given in Zoom online. And a lot of people can access. And after this meeting, they, they will be put into our SLMA YouTube's uh, channel and you can access any time. Then we have Saturday talks on various subjects which are mainly directed towards our medical students and early career doctors. Then we have regional meetings like this. We'll have another probably about eight meetings uh, in different parts of the country. We have the publications, of course, the flagship publication is the Sri Lanka Ceylon Medical Journal. We have a monthly newsletter and you can get a copy of the newsletter as you go out today. Uh, and then clinical and public health guidelines we are doing and also uh, public advocacy. Then uh, we have these expert committees on various subjects. I'll not go into details. Uh, so coming back to our theme towards human health care, uh, it's a fact that we have forgotten sometimes the ethical basis of our practice. We uh, start with doing no harm, but sometimes we violate certain principles. That's something that we have to accept. So as doctors, as as allied he health professionals, we have to remind ourselves that uh, we have to provide patient-centered health care. The, the uh, citizen or the individual is at the center of uh, health care. So we need to really uh, be mindful of providing a human health care in our system. To achieve excellence, we need to have good uh, knowledge, skills, 
and, and attitudes amongst our uh, medical staff, and that's a priority for us. Why equity? We see that though we have good health indicators, looking at it from a national perspective, the, there are disparities. If you look at the statistics just for batic flu, you can say whether it is, uh, it is uh, nutrition or any other indicator, there are vast disparities uh, to probably even another province or another district. So how do we address these uh, disparities or differences? That's very, very, very important. And how do we bring in partnerships? Now today, we are, uh, you are sharing with us a partnership that, will, that has fulfilled a very acute need in this area. So we need to develop that kind of partnerships because equity cannot be addressed only by he state health services. We have to uh, mobilize additional resources and we also have to address what you call the social determinants of health. Health is an outcome. Recording stopped. Very well. We cannot, as doctors or allied medical professionals, give health, good health to another person. It has to start from within the individual. Recording in progress. Or even before that, when the child is in mother's womb. So this type of addressing the determinants of health from at an early stage, bringing in different disciplines is so vitally important. And without addressing inequities, we can't progress uh, to the next stage of providing or achieving universal health care. Then we cannot uh, forget the community. People should be at the center of decision making. And unless people take uh, responsibility for their own health, uh, I don't think the health system can cope. So we are at a very critical juncture in, the, in, in healthcare in Sri Lanka, as you know. We have a lot of problems, challenges. We have health staff also leaving the country. But all of you who are present here today are determined to stay in this country and serve our people. And that is why, as Sri Lanka Medical Association, we are determined to provide whatever the assistance that we can as a professional organization, as the apex medical uh, association in Sri Lanka, to uh, enhance the knowledge and skills of our medical staff so that you will be further motivated to stay in this country, stay in the areas that you would like to serve our people, and the Sri Lanka Medical Association will always be there behind you to support you, and we look forward, although this may be a one-off event, with the uh, Batiklo Medical Association and the Directorate of Health Services in Batiklo, we would like to continue, follow up, uh, seminars or any even, even other action on the ground uh, to help improve the health services in this area. So I wish to thank the Batiklo Medical Association and Directorate of Health Services Batiklo as well as the Teaching Hospital Batiklo and all the other individuals who have been helping to make this event a success and I hope today all of you will gain something and will be able to help contribute to creating better health for the people of Batiklo, to the people of the Eastern Province and to the people of Sri Lanka. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that words of wisdom. I think as he reiterated, equity or excellence in healthcare cannot be achieved by individual players. Rather, we can achieve our objectives through collaborative work. Now, this session is one such good example. So I would like to uh, invite to speak to you the president of the Batiklo Medical Association, Dr. S. Branavan, on this collaboration and objectives of our workshop. So over to you. Good morning, everybody. Batiklo Medical Association cordially welcome Dr. Vinya Aryaratna, the President of Sri Lanka Medical Association and his team, all distinguished guests, my colleagues, eminent speakers, doctors, nurses, and all the participants of this program in this joint regional meeting with the Sri Lanka Medical Association. As Dr. Aryaratna stated, after a long time, Batiklo Medical Association is collaborating with the Sri Lanka Medical Association, I think maybe around 10 years, if I can remember, um, when Dr. Ajantan and others, we had a full day session here. 
And you know, Sri Lanka Medical Association is the highest medical professional body in Sri Lanka. And it regularly have um, regional meetings to upheld the um, health care of this country. So these type of regional meetings are real assets for uh, people and uh, health staff in peripheral areas because they bring very eminent speakers and they discuss the very important topics. Then people from the East are very happy that their long-term thirst for a cardiac investigation as an in, and an in interventional cardiac facilities is going to get fulfilled very soon in this region. Special thanks to Ms. Penny Jayavadana and Sri Satya Sai Baba Karunani Leam for this. I would like to state one more important thing that Baticlo Medical Association is in a process of requesting and collecting donations of very essential medicines and consumables for needy patients from this region. You know about the sh severe shortage of very essential, especially the oncological uh, medicines. So we would like to request this from the Sri Lanka Medical Association also in future to collaborate uh, and uh, collect some donations. <laughs> Without wasting my time, I wish everyone that to have a good academic program on this day. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for highlighting the opportunities as well as challenges in a regional context. Now, for this regional meeting, our theme is strengthening peripheries, reflections from the East. Now, to strengthen peripheries, as you all know, we need a collaboration between the clinical health streams as well as the public health stream. So we have here the leader of the uh, public health as well as the uh, uh, one who is uh, administrating the uh, regional hospitals as well as medical office of health officers, uh, the regional director of health services, Dr. G. Sugunan. So I would like to invite Dr. G. Sugunan to uh, give his reflections on the programs that he has been conducting as well as the importance of collaborations between the clinical and public health streams. So over to you. Thank you, Dr. Laihura. Very good morning, everyone. President of Sri Lanka Medical Association, Dr. Vinaya Aryaratna. President of Beticalo Medical Association, Dr. S. Branavan. Vice Chancellor of Eastern University of Sri Lanka, Professor V. Kanasingam. Deputy Director of Teaching Hospital, Beticalo, Dr. Mrs. Maidili. Dr. Livington. Dr. Katie Sundareshan and honorable speakers, members of SLMA and BMA, esteemed professionals, and all other participants, ladies and gentlemen. On the start, I kindly uh, request uh, President of BMA to make out an awareness program on the importance and participations of CMEs to the medical officers and it has to be done through the uh, consultants of this hospital because it's very essential and uh, so I have I, I don't want to I will take exactly five minutes uh, so that's why I, I have written and uh, came here thank you very much uh, uh, Dr. Katie Sundaresan 
to restrict me within five minutes. Uh, I have three messages uh, to the organizers and participants of uh, this uh, fantastic event. I am, uh, firstly, I am honored to be speaking with you today about the importance of continuous medical education. As we all know, the medical field is constantly evolving with discoveries, technologies, and treatment being developed every day. Keeping up with these changes is essential to providing the best care to our patients. Continuous medical education is critical for staying up to date with the latest developments in our field. It allows to us to brush up on existing knowledge and acquire new skills and knowledge that will enhance our abilities as medical professionals. One of the most significant benefits of continuous medical education is that ensures that we are providing the most evidence evidence-based treatment and effective treatment to the patients. We all know that medical practices can quickly become outdated and discoveries and research can lead to significant changes in our approach to the patient's care. It also enables us to network with other professionals in our field. Continuous medical education also helps us stay informed about changes in healthcare policies and regulations. In addition, continuous medical education can improve our job satisfaction. I urge all of us to make continuous medical education a priority in our practice and never stop learning. My second message is, as a public health representative, there's an important area in health is called public health care, which is comprised of health promotion, disease prevention, environmental health, emergency preparedness and response, health equity, health policy, nutrition, mental health. As a consultant community physician, the president of SLMA will understand the importance of the public health. We as a team, Baticolo Medical Association, Sri Lanka Medical Association, and private partners, especially Sri Satya Sai Karnanilayam Foundation, with the Ministry of Health, have to concentrate on and discuss current and future challenges of the health and the modalities how, in which way we will overcome these challenges. As a public health representative, I extend my hands to everyone and urge to uplift the innocent public of Baticolo district. Thirdly, on behalf of Regional Health Department of Baticolo, I extend my sincere thanks to Baticolo Medical Association and Sri Lanka Medical Association for their great combined effort in updating the knowledge of professionals here. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank the government of India and Sri Satya Sai Karna Nilaya because they have established a marvelous a free healthcare station in Baticolo for working with health authorities of the country. We look forward to continuing our partnership with all of you and achieving our short goal of promoting healthcare and well-being in our country. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for highlighting the uh, importance of collaboration between the public health as well as clinical health streams. Now, in this session, we have two separate sessions. First one will be prioritizing one of the innovative as well as important health initiatives that has been created through different collaborations. So our first session would be the triumphs and challenges, cath lab and cardiac surgery in 
Batik Lo, a collaboration with Satisri Sanjeevani Hospital. So to conduct this session, I would like to invite the person who has been a pillar of uh, strength for us at the Medical Association, Sri Lanka Medical Association, and for the entire Eastern region, Dr. Katie Sundaration, consultant physician, teaching hospital Batik Lo. He will uh, describe you about the next session. So over to you. The next symposium will be on, good morning to you all. The next symposium will be on the services provided by the Sri Satya Sai Foundation. There will be three speakers. So it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to the symposium to introduce the first ever free cardiothoracic and cath lab services provided by Sri Satya Sai Sanjeevani Hospital, Kiran Kulam Batikolo. In collaboration with the Eastern University of Sri Lanka, and the Ministry of Health. We are deeply indebted to Sri Sadhguru Madhusudan Sai. His compassion and care for the people of Sri Lanka is evident in his provision of cath lab within few months of our request. He also gracefully agreed to send essential oncology drugs worth 60 lakhs rupees within a week of being informed of the shortage. We express our sincere gratitude to Sri Sadhguru Madhusudan Sai and the Sri Sat Satya Sai Sanjeevani Hospital for their selfless service and dedication to providing quality health care to those in need. With these remarks, may I call upon the Vice Chancellor. We are privileged to have the Vice Chancellor with us today, who has worked tirelessly with the Sri Satya Sai Sanjeevani Foundation to bring Sadhguru's mission into reality. We eagerly look forward to hearing a few words from him about this noble initiative. Over to you, Vice Chancellor. The President of the Betik Law Medical Association, Dr. Pranaban and our Dr. Sunan, RDHS Batiklo, President of uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association, Dr. Vini Ari Ratna, and their distinguished invitees, Dean Faculty of Health Care Science, Dr. Sadanandan, and consultants and audience. Very good morning to you all. I believe uh, this could be the uh, important joint regional meeting associated with the very important stakeholders. Especially, there are a number of uh, organizations involved. Uh, I would uh, give a few important messages to you on behalf of the Eastern University of Sri Lanka. East, you know, Eastern University is located in uh, Vandarmula with uh, eight faculties, one of the uh, most important and pioneer faculty, Faculty of Health Care Sciences, which is located in Batiklo town. We have a number of consultants and academia who are more uh, energetic and uh, professionals. They are willing to work with all the regional developments. In this uh, introduction, uh, we got the opportunity to work with the Sri Satya Saiva Karnali Foundation, which is uh, uh, totally affiliated with the uh, Sri Sanjeevini Sadhi Saiba Hospital Network, which is the third largest hospital in the world, in the India. So they came with a big proposal to establish, uh, to enhance, especially pediatric cardiology unit in Batiklo. So faculty of uh, health care science, especially all the consultants, especially cardiologists uh, from hospital as well as uh, medical faculty, they came forward uh, we try our best to provide the service to the region. With our request, uh, we are here almost, I think, by next week, we could be able to get the cat lab. It could be ready to serve by the first week of uh, April. 
with the support of our three uh, cardiologists. The Sanjivini Hospital is a free education, free medical service all over the world, especially in India. Uh, they are going to have a free medical, first free medical college will be open day after tomorrow by Honorable Prime Minister Narendra Modi. That could be the first medical, free medical school in India. The Swami uh, Madhisadasai already agreed to accommodate few number of students from Sri Lanka uh, for a free medical college. They could be able to return back to Sri Lanka to serve. But I would uh, like to emphasize especially the regional health services, which is very important. As you know, the uh, sustainable development goals of the UN agenda. Number three is highly appropriate to serve on the uh, ensure health lives and promotion of well-being, which is connected with the regional health services. I know the strength of the RDHS, I know the strength of the medical faculty, as well as the strength of the teaching hospital particular. We are the three major uh, stakeholders with the association of these both uh, bodies. We have enough opportunity to ex expand, especially the regional health. I believe the health education is very, very important. Rather than generating knowledge, disseminating knowledge is very, very appropriate. That will save not only the non-communicable disease and communicable disease. So this is a good forum. We could be able to work especially to enhance the health services. You know, when we government or any world organization taking the statistics, they are not taking the health status of the cities. They are taking the whole countries. So all the regionals, all the village, all the family in the village will be reflected in the whole statistics. Therefore, every individual aspect of every individual uh, activities of this uh, uh, forum, like this, uh, your services definitely will enhance. As a university, we are having faculty of Kalka science. We are more happy to work with you. We are very happy to uh, share our resources. Already, I think, we have obtained a uh, quiet fund. Under the quiet fund, we have shared a lot of uh, resources to the teaching hospital. We, our health, human resources also already shared. So I hope uh, the another gift from Indian uh, people or world people. That is a Sanjeevini hospital located in Kirangulam, which is going to serve very important uh, service to our region, not the region for the country. Especially I know the people suffering a lot without getting the cattle facilities. So they are going to Jaffna, they are going to Colombo. So if you are going to the maybe in um, private hospitals, so it is not affordable to everyone. I believe the service of the cath lab and the cardiology surgery unit in uh, Sanjeevini Hospital in Batiklo definitely prevent our lives. So we could be able to do lot. So I uh, take this opportunity as a vice chancellor of the Eastern University. Uh, we are more uh, uh, happy to share the resources as much as we are more happy to disseminate the knowledge. We are aware whatever forum you are expected to disseminate the knowledge to the relevant people, to educate the people, make aware the people, we are more uh, happy. So I don't take more time. I think the speakers are uh, from Sanjeevini Hospital, they are eminent people, they could be able to talk a lot, lot about Sanjeevini as well as cardiology side. So thank you very much for the uh, medical association Batiklo as well as Sri Lanka. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chancellor. The next speaker is Mrs. Penny Javardana. She will be joining via Zoom from India. It's my pleasure to introduce to you a truly remarkable individual, Mrs. Penny Javardana, who, with the blessing of blessings of Sri Sadguru Madhusudan Sai initiated the Sri Satya Sai Sanjeevani Hospital in Kirankulam, Betikolo. 
her selfless devotion to the hospital has transformed the lives of numerous individuals in Sri Lanka. Mrs. Jayawardhan is not only the chairperson of the Sri Satya Sai Karuna Nilayam, also the fo uh, foundation, but also a passionate animal rights activist and advocate for plant-based diet for health and wellness. Her contribution to the fields of health, education, and disaster relief are truly remarkable. Along with her late husband, Mr. Ravi Jayawardhan, she has served the people of Sri Lanka for over 40 years. It is an honor to have Mrs. Jayawardhana with us today, and we look forward to learn, learning more about the healthcare services provided by Sri Satya Sai Sanjeevani Hospital. Let us warm, warmly welcome her. Over to you, Mrs. Jayawardhana. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for this opportunity, this remarkable opportunity. I'm humbled to have been invited to be to be a part of this, uh, for me, a very rare um, meeting. I'm here at the invitation of uh, Sadhguru Sri Madhusudan Sai to attend the inauguration of the first free medical school in India. It is going to be opened by Modiji, the Prime Minister of India, the man who selflessly and fearlessly assisted our country in its darkest hours and has helped us to begin a new life in Sri Lanka. Thank you, Prime Minister Modiji. We can't forget you. I have many people I have to thank. The Vice Chancellor of the Eastern University, Dr. Sundareshan, Dr. Sugunanna RDHS, the Director of the Batikalo Teaching Hospital, and you, Dr. Vinay. I don't know whether you are aware, but in 2017, when we opened our OPD and medical center in Kirankulam in Batikalo, your mother was the guest of honor at the opening of our center. Since then, we have treated over 18,000 patients through our OPDs. All have received treatment as well as free medicine. We respect and honor your parents, uh, dear Dr. Vinay. I was also in India when Sadhguru Madhusudan Sai gave him the highest honor of the Award of Human Excellence for his services in Sri Lanka. So you may think you're here by coincidence, but I don't believe so. For us, there are no coincidences. There are only Sai incidences. And you happen to be the first one to bring us into the SLMA forum. Thank you, Dr. Vinay. So there's not much I have to say. Um, I'm the one who gets all the accolades for having been there. I started work in Batikalo seven years ago. It was just a bare land when we took over. But there are thousands of devotees from around the world who have supported us. Mr. Sutarshan, who actually brought to the notice of Sri Satya, of Sadhguru Madhusudan Sai that there was this land in Batikalo in Kirankulam. And that is from where our work started. Of course, our love and reverence for our inspiration, Sadhguru Sri Madhusudan Sai, whose love and affection for Sri Lanka its people, but still, even though I've worked with him for seven years, it still doesn't cease to amaze me how much he loves us. And I think if all of us combine under the slogan of one world, one family, there's nothing we can't achieve, nothing we can't achieve. Since we began our services in, in pediatric surgery, Ten, nine children have been restored to health. They've all started school. I hear from their families often. They can't thank us enough. So I ask all of you, please join us. We're here for you. I remember when I came to this village in 2015, people of the village came and asked me, you know, how do we know that you're going to be here with us? We have NGOs who come and go. They ask us, they tell us they're going to help us and we never see them. And I said, look, 
I can't tell you that now, but in time you will realize that we are here for you. My appeal is that we never forget that healthcare is for the patient. It's for the patient and generally the patient who has nothing other than to come to us and be healed. And this is where I love Baticolo. I love the doctors and the people there. They have been selfless and worked very hard to help us to reach out to those who really need us. I may not remember everyone in saying thank you, but you know who you are. The, the Eastern University, Professor Kanaga Singham, the head of the medical faculty, Dr. Ra Dr. Rajivan, Dr. Vinodan, Dr. Sugunan, Dr. Kala, director of the Batikalo Teaching Hospital. Thank you for all your services and you've always helped me whenever I've needed it. And I'm going to put a request out here to all of you. Please help us find a doctor to run our OPD services uninterrupted. In your audience today is Dr. Ramesh Rao. Dr. Ramesh Rao has been sent to work with us. He's a complete, he works on a completely voluntary basis. He can answer any questions about the foundation and our work. So I won't take much of your time because he's there with you. My love and veneration to all of you. And we pray that the cat lab that has landed, it has arrived in Sri Lanka, Dr. Vinodan and Dr. Rajivan, that that machine will be in your hands. God bless you all. And thank you for everything you all have done to enable Foundation to reach out her arms to the people of Lanka. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you. Thank you very much for the heart touching uh, short talk by Mrs. Penny Javatane. Next, the speaker is Dr. Ragini. He'll be introduced by Dr. Vaide here, our mic, uh, consultant microbiologist. Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure, honor, and privilege to introduce a personality like Dr. Ragini Pandey. Dr. Ragini Pandey is a card consultant cardiac surgeon. She had been working in the, in the United Kingdom for more than a decade as, um, and served for another country and she decided to quit the job and came to her own country and joined this charity. When she and her team crossed the borders to serve for Sri Lanka last year, it was not a red carpet that they faced. So many hurdles, so many obstacles they had to navigate. As an infection control specialist, I admired and I appreciate, greatly appreciate their effort and dedication towards maintaining the infection prevention con and control in, during their services at the Kiran Kulam. They had to initiate every single thing from the beginning because that hospital was just built, but they had to furbish everything from the equipment, everything. So as a surgeon, how she led her team, I, I witnessed personally, and I never saw such a surgeon, such a dedicated surgeon who gives such an importance to infection control and prevention. And that's the reason I'm here to introduce her. It's my honor and privilege. Dr. Ragini, it's over to you. Please enlighten us on your field. Uh, hello. Uh, good morning. Uh, can you hear me, please? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can, Ragini. Go ahead. Thank you. So um, I would like to say, I go one. Uh, good morning and uh, namaste to everybody. Uh, first and foremost, um, I would like to thank uh, the whole Eastern University, the Sri Lanka Medical uh, Association for giving me this opportunity to be talking uh, with you and communicating with you. Uh, it is a great privilege. Um, my topic is about heart to heart uh, and about the trials and tribulations and uh, what it took to create a heart center in Sri Lanka. Um, 
I'm not going to dwell into uh, what the problems the country was facing and what was happening. Uh, the only thing I would say, and coming from uh, a family of uh, Sai devotees, one thing I would like to say is, um, we believe in Vasudev Kutumbakam. The world is a family. And if we are a family, then how can we sit back and watch when one member of the family is shedding tears? And that was the reason why our dear Madhusudan Sai sent us to Sri Lanka. Just two days ago, we were celebrating in India the day of the sparrow, because this little bird sparrow is getting extinct in India. And there's a beautiful story of the sparrow, uh, which is very famous in the Indian folklore, where there was a village which was burning and all the villagers started fleeing. And this little sparrow was carrying little bits of water in her beak, trying to douse the fire. And at the end of the day, the fire didn't get doused, but looking at her, the villagers came back and tried to save the village. Uh, of course, there was destruction uh, and a very cynical crow is looking at the sparrow and asking her, uh, how, what have you achieved? You know, you carried two mLs of water in your beak and tried to douse the fire. It did not make a difference. So the sparrow tells the crow, it is true that perhaps I have not stopped the destruction, but when history looks at me, I will be perceived as the bird who tried to do something about the fire rather than wait and watch like you. So when our neighbors are going through a difficult times, rather than waiting and watching, it's better to go and help in whatever way you can, basically. And that was the reason. How do I look at Batikola and Sri Lanka mission? I feel like a mother who has gone through labor pains. There is blood, there is sweat, there is tears, there is screaming, there is shouting. But the end of it all, there was life. A beautiful baby was born. And if you ask any mother who has given birth to a child, she will tell you that all of it was worth it. So what I'm going to say is, yes, there was trials and tribulations. I'm not going to dwell on all the things and the difficulties that Sri Lanka has faced post COVID in the past year. You have suffered it. We had just watched while you suffered all the trials and tribulations. But what I would like to remember about Sri Lanka is the beauty of the people of Sri Lanka, the resilience of an ancient civilization, which was knocked down and it decided to stand up again with courage to face the difficulties and to triumph over their trials and tribulation to maintain services and to get life back in order. And that is how I want to remember Sri Lankans. And that is exactly how I want uh, Sri Lanka to be perceived. So Sri Lanka, Batikola to me is exactly like, like Raipur. It is as dear to me as Raipur is. As I worry about Raipur on a daily basis, so do I worry about Batikola. And I remember Batikola with a lot of love in my heart, all my friends who have become family, Dr. Vaidehi, um, Dr. Francis, um, uh, the doctors in the Kalumni Base Hospital, uh, the whole Eastern University with whom we have shared lunches, our trials and tribulations. So when I look at this mission, the first thing which also comes to my mind is building bridges. We have built bridges. And why do we want to build bridges? Because we want to communicate and exchange knowledge, which the Eastern University has so beautifully uh, facilitated. I am so delighted that the cat lab has started in Sri Lanka and soon within say six months of starting our surgeries, the cat lab has started and I'm sure the wonderful team of cardiologists from the Eastern universities will save some more lives uh, with the help of the Sai mission in Sri Lanka. When, when I look back at Batikola, what are the difficulties which I found were significant? Uh, uh, the first difficulty which I found, uh, which I need to overcome on a personal basis was communication. Uh, I found that I was not able to communicate with the parents of the children uh, that I was able to, uh, I was going to operate. Taking consent, which is a very uh, important thing, had to be done by an interpreter. And uh, you may have very good interpreters, but taking consent with the help of an interpreter perhaps is not necessarily the best thing. So perhaps we need to polish on the skills in learning uh, Singla and Tamil both together. Uh, 
It is also very important to be able to tell the mothers and the fathers uh, the condition of their child, even to be able to tell them that the operation has gone well and all is well. It makes a difference because this is what they want to hear and they want to hear it from their surgeon. Uh, for some reason, the way surgeons are perceived by the world for good reason or bad reason, uh, they are perceived as the leaders and the captains of the ship. So no matter what any other member of the team tells the parent, uh, it is important for them that the surgeon communicates to them about what is going on with their child. And that is the kind of trust uh, people have uh, on the surgeon. And so one thing, the first thing is communication. The more we talk to each other, the more we dispel our perception and the biases towards each other. And the more these biases are dispelled, the more we will learn to trust each other. And it is very important to trust each other because unless we uh, trust, unless we trust each other, we will not be able to work together. Rest of the problems in related to finances, uh, in relation to equipment, in relation to getting things done, infrastructure building will eventually come over. But the biggest hurdle towards providing healthcare is manpower, expertise, providing skills. And once these teams are built, the interpersonal relationships between the team and whether they work towards the same aim of providing good care for the patients. And all this matters. Uh, basically. So one is trust. And this is one thing I found when you go from one country to the other country, it is very natural for people to be untrusting of each other, basically. But in Baticola, we found this innocent people who are ready to accept our help. And I'm really grateful to this whole region of Baticola for accepting us. Uh, I cannot be more grateful. I think for a mother to give her child for a life-saving surgery in which the child could die to an unknown person from another country whose language they do not understand is a great leap of faith. And to be, to be a privilege to have that kind of trust from another country uh, um, is a blessing, I think. And I feel very blessed by Swami to have this privilege of being able to help in such a kind of way. So one thing is building trust with your patients, but also building trust with all the other colleagues in the region. We all want to provide healthcare, which is excellent. We all want to provide healthcare where quality is at a premium. We also want to decrease the mortality. We also want to decrease the morbidity. And for that, we need a multidisciplinary team. And fortunately in Baticola, with the help of the universe, uh, uh, with the help of the university, we were able to get um, people like Dr. Vaidehi, who came to us every week to see that the theaters were sterile, came up with a lot of protocols. We had the Kaluna base hospital who, who helped us out with the sterilization and providing us with the autoclave and cleaning uh, equipment. We also were provided blood gas machine by the uh, Kalumna Base Hospital at the last moment. So third thing which I would like to say is collaboration. So there was a lot of collaborative effort in Baticola and all of it stemmed from one single fact. Uh, the single fact was we want to do good for the patients of this particular region which I believe has been neglected for a long time. And there is definitely a North and South sort of uh, divide. Uh, so the only way you can build trust is to showcase the work that you have done. And once we start working and showing the quality of the work, hopefully people will come to trust us. I'm not going to run through uh, uh, a list of things that we have done in Raipur, uh, just a very brief glimpse into the problems that we are facing as a region. Basically, I believe the problems in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Vietnam, Cambodia, all are the same. We are all perceived as the developing world. I do not agree with that because this perception is based on finances and economics. I think we are from the East. We are a very ancient civilization collectively. We have roots which are deeper than most of the Western countries. And philosophically, spiritually, we are more advanced than any country in the West. So we, I do not perceive ourselves as a developing world. I think financially we are weak at the moment and being financially weak does not uh, say that we are lesser human beings. So collectively, if we kind of say that we face the same problems, 
So whatever problems are there in India, are there in Sri Lanka, there in Pakistan, there in Bangladesh and in the whole of the region. And the problem stems, one is from corruption and because of politics and lack of leadership. Uh, we cannot do perhaps much more about it, but in our own small kind of way, we can enhance and push the possibilities. And how do we do that? How do we do that? One thing is we start trusting each other. We start sharing our problems. We start finding common solutions to our common problems in a collective kind of way. And I'm, I'll give you an example of this. We, we see children who are delayed for their operations, children with a VSD, who develops pulmonary hypertension does not get um, health care in time. We do not see this kind of children in the West. We see more of these children. We should be experts in the problem, which is our local, and we need to find a local solution by means of auditing, by means of research, uh, which is collaborative, and find local solutions to our local problem ra rather than relying on people who do not see this kind of problems. And that is the reason why we need to open up our doors and collaborate with each other. And that can happen only when we build trust. One, one problem I actually need to mention is facilitate, facilitation of this flow of people across countries. And that has to be facilitated by the bureaucracy. Uh, we have to perceive each other as assets. We have to sort of dissolve the boundaries and have a free flow of people from one, per, one place to the other. I wouldn't say country. I wouldn't say place. From one, um, uh, one I wouldn't even say region. We need to facilitate the movement of experts, be it in Sri Lanka who can come to India and teach us something, be it Indians going there or anybody. We need to have a free flow of movement, a free flow of knowledge and free flow of collaboration because we all want to do good. And I think this is where bureaucracy can help us. One thing is, it is very good to have rules. It is good to have rules because we are worried about the safety of our patients. And we need to have standards of quality. We need to have standards of expertise. And we need to have um, st standards to ensure that the, those who are weak and those who are vulnerable are not uh, falling prey to idiosyncrasies, idiosyncrasies and attitudes of behavior. Uh, but that also does not mean that the standards and the rules should be so rigid that it stops um, uh, flow at all. So we need to find a golden mean wherein we allow knowledge to flow within the confines of the safety and efficacy and keeping in view uh, uh, the provision of care. If you look at the data, if you look at the data of the WHO and how they rank uh, the healthcare system of, uh, of the world, you will see that US falls down to 27th, which is a very low dismal um, uh, ranking given the amount of money that they spend their healthcare, uh, on their healthcare. So the amount of money which US spends per capita on healthcare is at least 10 times more than Europe. And yet the, in the terms of ranking, this healthcare stands a dismal 27. And what is one of the reasons why it stands so low? One reason is access to care. So WHO looks at access to care as one of the big indicators of quality of healthcare that is provided. Affordability is the second thing. If you provide access to healthcare to those who are unserved, as Swami says, you make it affordable. And if you cannot make it affordable, can we make it free to those who cannot pay anything? That should be the ideal goal. So providing access, making it affordable, or making it free of cost. And once you have made it affordable and accessible, the third thing is to maintain quality uh, of healthcare by reducing mortality and morbidity and make it equitable and equality based. And that would be exceptionally good healthcare. And I think in Baticola, we can start this sort of wonderful model where we'll provide healthcare to an unserved sort of population. Uh, one of the reasons I, after having a lot of discussion with my friends in Sri Lanka was, why do you have another hospital in a far off remote Batikola rather than having another hospital in Colombo? And one reason, one reason, having worked in the UK uh, for almost 18 years of my life, we decided as a country to decentralize healthcare. And one of the reasons for that is no mother has to travel to a tertiary care center for more than two and a half hours to have access to healthcare. 
So if we are worried about children and if you are worried about their parents, then can you imagine the situation of a mother who has a child of a tetralogy of fallow, who is spelling, who needs urgent emergency cardiac care, and she has to travel 350 kilometers to come to a center. So we need to have certain amount of decentralization so that we take the healthcare to the doorstep of the people who will not be able to travel to long and far off places. Is it also important to have tertiary healthcare in various reasons? It is. Why? Because if you are running a university and you are running an academy and you're running education, then you need to have at least one tertiary care hospital for capacity building, for enhancement of care and dissemination of knowledge because the quality of your universities will depend upon the quality of people who are coming out of those universities and that will determine on their expertise and on their knowledge. And unless you have these services running in your hospitals, the quality of education and the quality of doctors which come out of your new universities uh, will not be high. So it is important that we have regional tertiary care hospitals which provide opportunity for education and skill enhancements which are local. Third thing, and which is the important thing which I found in Baticola is these hospitals also provide uh, support to the communities in terms of employment that is provided to the local people. So to have tertiary care hospitals, which enhances uh, the quality of the medical education, which helps the quality uh, of the care that we provide in addition to sort of uh, providing the care closer to home for a parent uh, who may find it very difficult to access far flung hospitals. It is important that centers like Baticola are created and are sustained, uh, uh, basically. Um, uh, another thing which I sort of wanted to mention here is after having spoken to my colleagues like Professor Kalangos, who is the president of uh, humanitarian, uh, global humanitarian aid and care, um, uh, we and we, I would like to speak to the Eastern University on this, whether we could have a global or an international body for accreditation of doctors, which could provide us with an accrediting statement going through all the uh, sort of possibilities so that these doctors are more mobile and they're able to focus and provide healthcare even at short notice to countries that are in crisis. Uh, if I give you an example, you, you have an earthquake in Turkey on a daily basis, 20,000 people are dying. We cannot be sort of wasting our time in paperwork. So if we cannot, if we can have a global forum, like we have a global forum of surgery and a global humanitarian aid where doctors could sign up, get themselves credential so that they are available to be recognized by the uh, medical councils of various countries and the medical councils of those countries will feel assured and feel safer allowing these this doctors into that country. So hopefully, um, uh, I think with the help of Professor Kalangus and Professor uh, Salvatore Agati of Congenital Heart Academy, and of course, uh, with people in uh, Sri Lanka and India and Fiji, if we can come up with a credentialing sort of uh, um, uh, body, uh, it would help transfer of care more easily uh, as compared to what it is, what it is now. So, um, for me, I think it is more of a sort of emotional journey uh, and I'm going only going to look forward uh, because what do we do with Baticola now? I think with cath lab coming with a uh, functional operation theater, what we need is manpower, what we need is capacity building, we, what we need is teaching and training. So let us put into place all these things where we can have again exchange of students who can come to India or uh, exchange of students who can go to other countries or people from here who can go teach and train and have a sustainable core manpower which will stay and run uh, the hospital in Baticola. For me, Baticola is the hospital which is going to be run by Sri Lankans and for Sri Lankan patients. So it is off Sri Lanka, by Sri Lanka, and for Sri Lanka. Uh, we will be standing on the sidelines and clapping when you um, sort of achieve all your goals. Uh, and I'm looking forward to that day when I go to Baticola and I watch a Sri Lankan surgeon with a Sri Lankan anesthetist, a Sri Lankan perfumist, and everybody from Sri Lanka performing the operations. And I'll be sitting outside sipping coffee and saying, well done chaps. Very well done. Thank you so much for showing me this day. So let's work towards that. Let's 
please work towards that to have our own sort of local sort of team of doctors who would be doing that thing. And that would be the most satisfying and most happy day uh, in life for me. Um, so uh, to sum, sum it all up, uh, how was Sri Lanka? Again, I say uh, it is a fruit of labor. I feel like a mother who has given birth to a child. I'm looking at the child who is thriving, who is growing. I'm dreaming of a beautiful future for this child of mine. Uh, and I'm uh, asking blessings and praying to God, please take away all the trials and tribulation. Let this child thrive. And lastly, just want to end um, with something for all the young doctors who are there. There is a beautiful poem by John Dunn, uh, who said, do not send to ask for whom the bells toll. Every time they toll, they toll for thee. I'm interested in humanity. Every death diminishes me. So let us be doctors such that every death, every pain hurts us so much that we want to do something about it. Because we as a professions are the most humane and the noble professions. The reason we become doctors is because we want to help uh, humanity. So let us be diminished by every death. Let us not wait and watch. Let us do something about it. Thank you so much. And very, very big thank you and gratitude to all my friends in Baticola in Sri Lanka for giving me the opportunity to serve the little children in Sri Lanka. When they came here, I remember the Sri Lankan parents as the most well-behaved parents, the most um, accommodating parents, the most understanding of all the prayer parents. And uh, I have such beautiful memories of those people. And I'm looking forward to coming back and meeting them again and meeting all of you again. Please come and visit us in Raipur. Let us communicate with each other. Let us collaborate with each other and let us build nations on based on trust and the common aim of doing good. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Ragini Pandey. Um, I think we are, the Sri Lankans are really thankful to you and the team. There were 25 came here for the services you have done to our motherland. So I think many of you may be no, not knowing that they have started uh, doing cardiothoracic surgery for congenital heart disease in August. And they did nearly seven, I think seven children. And the plan was to do nearly 20 to 30 per month, I think. Uh, but by this time, there should be maybe hundreds of children could have been benefited. The list I heard, the standing, I mean, the waiting list in Sri Lanka is nearly 2,000. So they want to clear that with the help of LRH doctors and the university and our teaching hospital doctors. But unfortunately, there are lots of restrictions, lots of problems came in between, so they couldn't. They are ready, the team is ready, and everything's for free, but I feel we are not ready. So I'm sure the SLMA should take this also because it's a national problem, not only a particular problem, it's a recent problem. Sri Lanka, when we are in the crisis, I think when they are ready, I think we should somehow work together and make sure that things are happening the right way. So thank you very much, Dr. Ragini. The next speaker, actually Dr. Ragini is uh, speaking from uh, uh, Raipur. So Sadhguru's Mother's Sai selected that particular hospital. It's a very rural, remote area. So unlike in our country, he has selected a very rural area where kind of a you know, very village area. So purposely selected to give a good care to those people who are in need, rather than they, they don't need to travel far. So with that remark, uh, next speaker is Dr. Vinodhan. That's going to be another very important talk on cath lab. So he's a consultant cardiologist who will be delivering his speech on the cath lab services provided by Sri Satyasai Sanjeevani Hospital in Kirankula, Batikolo, in collaboration with Eastern University Sri Lanka and the Ministry of Health. We express our heartfelt gratitude to our cardiologists for their dedication to providing selfless and free services to the people. It was through their sincere request that Sri Sadhguru Madhusudan Sai responded positively and brought the cath lab to the hospital within a few months of the request. The cath lab has already reached Sri Lanka. Maybe within a few days, it will reach Batikolo. So without further delay, I invite Dr. Vinodhan to share his valuable insight on the cath lab services by Sri Satya Sai Sanjeevani Hospital. Over to you. 
at the end there will be question and answer session so uh, dr penny jawardhan and dr ragini you can stay please Vinaya Aryarthana, President of uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association, uh, Professor V. Kanayasingam, Vice Chancellor of Eastern University, Dr. S. Brennan, uh, President of the Medical Medical Association, uh, Dr. Maitri, Deputy Director, TJ Hospital, Batikalo, Dr. Sugunan, RDHS, Batikalo, Satya Sai Hospital staffs, and my dear colleagues. So, this presentation is regarding cath lab services in Batikalo, from vision to reality. Um, before presenting this presentation here, there may be some lot controversies here in this topic. So I, what I had done, I sent this presentation to one some of my senior colleagues with, who know to, known the histories and things. I make sure I'm not hurting anyone's feelings. So the first of all, why we need a catheter laboratory? So if you go on through these slides, around 50.7% of the deaths in government hospitals of Sri Lanka is due to non-communicable disease. This is the data from NCD to 2019. And you can see almost like uh, among the 29,918 deaths mentioned here, around 17,159, that means 57.3% of the disease are from uh, cardiovascular disease. So trends of mortality due to chronic NCDs in government hospitals. So if you go on through this, once again, you can see the blue line is ischemic heart disease, which is in the top, and showing the rising tendency. So now we will come to the slice of STEMI management call, STA elevation myocardial infarction. What is the management goal? What we say, time is muscle. A person, the time he got the heart attack onwards, if we revascularize them early, there's a chance we can get good cardiac functions back. So that's what we mentioned in our cardiology team to achieve prompt, complete, and sustained reperfusion of the infarct-related artery. So if you go through this slides, relationship between myocardial salvage and survival, so you can see the first three hours are very crucial. Amount of salvageable myocardium is really high, especially in the first three hours. That is the reason they say time is muscle. So this slide explains standard guidelines. When you have a STEMI diagnosis, if you are a PCI capable center, you must offer the PCI within 60 minutes of admission. But if we are a non-primary PCA capable center like Baticolo, if we can do the PCA within 120 minutes of admission, then we should consider about that. What they say is as early as possible, less than 90 minutes is the preferred time, but 120 minutes is fine. When the patient can't, uh, if we can't get them the uh, PCIs within 120 minutes, then what they recommend is, go for an immediate fibrinolysis. That's what we are doing now. Then if successful fibrinolysis, arrange the angiogram within 24 hours of admission. But if it is failed, what they say is go for a rescue PCI urgently. This is where we are struggling. When the patients are fibrinolyzed, when we have a failed thrombolysis or STEMI patient, we can't provide the care of interventions at all at present. Very limited cases accepted by Paul Narva and my dear colleagues, really thank for you. 
this is a, I like to show you an angiogram of a patient who has undergone uh, medical thrombolysis. Then you can see the left anterior descending artery that is where I rounded. So we are given the thrombolysis and we, the lesions are like this. So that is the reason. So the consecutive slides, you can see right coronary artery is fine. And uh, this is after the balloon dilatation, the flow is established. And we are sending that and the final results. So this is the main reason why we request the catalogs. So if you go through this one, when the patient comes to you with, uh, I mean, when the patient develops the symptoms of chest pain or some sort of things, till they reach the hospital, first medical contact, there will be a delay. That's the patient delay. It will be very, very, I mean, depending on their knowledge, distance between the hospital and the patient's home, lots of factors in influence here. The time to first medical con uh, contact on was within 10 minutes, what we request to make a diagnosis with the ACP. Then we should consider whether the reperfusion we are going to uh, do by uh, thrombolysis or PCA. For example, I mentioned the previous slide, how we had to make the decisions. So depending on that, what they say is system delay. For example, a patient is admitted and you are providing the efficient flow till the time we say system delay. Altogether, altogether we say time to reperfusion therapy, you know. So, What's wrong with the medicines, actually speaking? They're also working well. So if you go through that, so I like to highlight the area of chemistry flow, that means the normal flow. You can see streptokinase, only 32% of the time is going to give you a chemistry flow. But we use tenetriplase, 63% of the time we may achieve chemistry flow. That means more than one third of the cases, we are not going to have flow. So this is the nationwide number of catheter diagnosis and treatment for ischemic heart disease in patient, uh, I mean in 2025, what they expect compared to now, compared to 2014, where they have performed around 30,500 cases it will be raised around 44,000 in 2025. That means around 13,000 is getting increased in 2025. In addition, what are the things we can provide in cath labs? We can do the valvular heart interventions, congenital heart interventions, other cardiac interventions and researches and things, and cardiac electrophysiology, especially the pacemaker, ablation, and other procedures. This was the recommendation made by Sri Lankan College of Cardiologists. Provision of at least a single cath lab for each province and ensure adequate coverage for primary or rescue PCS for STEMIs. The message is very clear. We have to do the things. Not only Sri Lankan College of Cardiology, our ministry also took the wise decision. 2016 to 2020, you can see the national multi-sectoral action plan for prevention and control of non-communicable diseases. According to them, what they mentioned, establish PCI centers, one per province in, in a phase manner. This was a decision made and published in 2016 to 2020. So the conclusion is very clear. Establishment of a cath lab, at least one for each province before expansion to others. Conclusion by everyone, including NMOH. The top list are Batiklo, Badula, and Ratnapura. Hence, this is our vision to have the cath lab in Batiklo. Now, let's see. What are the government hospitals has cath lab facilities in Sri Lanka? 
you can see the western part is overcrowded so i try to show them in the map so it's not possible by map so top you can see the jaffna then uh, andradhapura polnarva kunagala kandy and uh, ragama palathura and western province so that's the reason i try to make the things a bit sparse the red color ones are from western province and north central from green and the uh, rest of the province you know whatever the things i have mentioned here so if you go to the private hospital with cath lab facility once again colombo has almost six hospitals with cath lab facilities and if you just take outside the colombo uh, asri kandi rohno hospitals uh, gol and uh, i think now the super seven hospital in kandi also going to have a cath lab so this clearly indicate almost like a 12 labs are within western province compared to the rest of the countries now this slide is very interesting for example cath lab service history 1968 the first cath lab uh, has been uh, in, you know um, made, made i mean implanted in uh, national hospital of sri lanka and they have done the first angiogram by 1970 <coughs> since then in 1994 therapeutia has got the cath lab then the order was okay actually 2004 sri jayawardena pro general hospital flowed by lrh in 2005 national hospital of kandy in 2006 <coughs> gurunagala teaching hospital in 2009 Jaffna Teaching Hospital in 2011, Perdenia Shrima Obandaranaika Children's Hospital in 2013, and Antrapura has got a second-hand cath lab in 2015, and it has uh, got fold and 2016 they replaced the new, and 2017 uh, again uh, Kurunagala also got the cath lab. Then 2017 Polnarua, which is one of the deviation from the national policy. 2022 once again the deviation from the national policy and 2023 ragama got the cath lab so where the objectives had been deviated so i try to find a google cath lab better glow page not found So ideally speaking, my presentation should finish here. Vision to have a cath lab, reality do not have cath lab. Not even a single catheter laboratory for entire eastern part of the Sri Lanka, including in private sectors. Entire eastern coast includes Chinkamali, Batikalo, and Ambara, with a population of 1.73 million. Current data. these are the hospitals in uh, eastern province uh, who are getting or transferring the patient for advanced care to the teaching hospital batiklo you have to notice the geolocation of batiklo if you take uh, the eastern province it's a long province the central is still batiklo geolocation is more important when we are implanting an advanced care facilities so now we will come and look at teaching hospital batiklo so our objective to become a center of excellence in delivering curative and rehabilitative services 30 years of ethnic war has significantly affected the development of this entire region 77 specialists are providing wide range of care with the limited available facilities land area of uh, 7200 square meters 40 wards bed strength of uh, 1157 each year on 112000 patient receive in ward treatment and approximately 200000 patient attend the outpatient department and clinics it is the primary training facility for eastern university of sri lanka medical faculty so why it should be the better glow rather than other hospitals in eastern province largest center in the eastern province 
1.73 million population, one teaching hospital in the Eastern Province for medical students and nursing students. Geolocation, 76 kilometers from Ampara and 140 kilometers from Trikamali. Already three consultants are working, two are from Ministry of Health and one from University of uh, uh, Medical Faculty. Now we will see what sort of development we have achieved in, uh, since the uh, start in Betic Law, especially the cardiology services. The first ECG has performed in 1968. And the first exercise ECG were performed under the guidance of Dr. Vivekananda Raja, consultant physician in 2004. And coronary care unit also was established in 2006. Cardiology unit was established by Dr. Manogaran, who became the first board certified consultant cardiologist appointed to teaching hospital Vatican Law uh, in 2007. Currently, we offer um, echocardiograms, exercise ECG, and um, various advanced echo imaging facilities, pacemakers, temporary pacemakers, halters, and ambulatory blood pressure monitors. Now we will go struggles for life saving in the eastern part of the Sri Lanka. The history starts in 2010, where the Dr. Arunadi has made the steps to get a cath lab to the eastern part. This presentation was made in 2010 to Ministry of Health to get their cath lab under Chinese assistance. And uh, you may notice a uh, health development committee in 21, 2015 proposed a cath lab. It was from a uh, same Chinese fund assistant, which was requested in 2010. These are the document clearly mentioned, uh, additional equipments required for the present functioning of unit. You may see the cath lab has been approved. Since then, um, story goes, multiple letters in 2017. Uh, I think that time Dr. Dr. Ibrahlepe was the director. He was requested because there was a lab, there's a chance we can get the lab, which, is, which has gone to Polnarua. So since G lab engineers started to visit our cardiology building after that and supervise the building, they suddenly stopped coming since August, 2019. Our building progression also was stopped because of not getting funds. Thereafter, various letters. So this is from Daily News. Kalpana General Hospital Development, you know, 12,000 million under three year plan. So we can connect the dots. So this was the last letter in the meeting we made to get the things right, but we failed. This is from uh, WHO, health inequities and their causes. There's ample evidence that social factors, including education, employment, status, income level, gender, and ethnicity have a marked influence on how healthy a person is. Health inequities are systemic differences in the health status of the different population groups. These inequities have significant social and economic cost, both to individuals and societies. Life is not fair and easy, but what is right is known to your mind no matter how much unfairness we got, how many times we were disgraced, how many times we fall, what is important is how you reacted at the time of stressful situations. So how do we handle the struggle? So the great consultant, Dr. Aronidi, he started uh, the take the patients to Candy Teaching Hospital monthly since 2015, 16 times monthly. He gone with the patient with mitral stenosis and performed the PTMCs and brought the patients back. Since 2017, we team of three cardiologists, myself, uh, Dr. Francis Rajivan and Dr. Arunadi, 
visited to Jaffna Teaching Hospital for doing PCIs weekly. Later, after COVID situation, we made this shift as every other week. So at this moment, I would like to express my heartiest thanks to consultant cardiologist and the cath lab team of Jeffna to accommodate us and tolerate us and let us to do and perform our procedures. We traveled every week to Jeffna since 2017. More than 1,500 procedures we have performed. After COVID-19 outbreak, we were able to travel every other week only. And even within the last one year period, we have almost completed 334 cases with 71 PCIs. That means roughly we have performed like 32 cases per month. We have trained our nurses, cardiographers for cath lab procedures, preparing for running the cath lab from uh, if the ministry provides the lab in teaching hospital particular. It is really unfortunate THB still has not provided with the lab due to change of priorities. Final attempts made to correct the issues further delayed by COVID-19 outbreak and economic crisis. This is where we have come across Sadhguru. In August 6, 2022, we had the first meeting with him. A heart who has the heart to listen to our struggles. A hospital for poor does not necessarily mean a poor hospital. It is a world-class hospital with the standard equipments. You should feel even better to treat your own kids. So Sri Satya Sai Sanjeevani Super Speciality Hospital Betiklo, a new cath lab floor made within two months. Cath lab regulations for the trust made with the support of TJ Hospital Betiklo, EUSL and Sai Institute. Working plan made, algorithms made to provide coordinated care between THB and Sai Sanjeevani Hospital. To maintain the international standards, we have made lots of uh, documentations and hardware for the cath lab and procedures are also on the way. You see the cath lab floor is now getting run. So this is the, I mean, the no, um, like a BHT kind of thing. We are going to made in Thai hospital for follow up the patients. This is the algorithm we made to coordinate between Sai hospital and PJ hospital for the next six months. So here the shortcoming is here. I like to highlight, uh, as I told you earlier, the primary PCI within three hours. So you see in this algorithm, it is not mentioned because without having a cath lab within the hospital, it's very difficult to take the patient immediately on time with all the staff arranging the things. So that's the reason what we thought is to give the thrombolytic treatment and the patient who has a failed thrombolysis take them to Sai Hospital and get them the procedure urgently. The rest of the cases we can manage. Non-STEMIs, STEMI equivalents, and prop negative. So we have the plans how to go on. This is the model of the lab we are going to receive to uh, Sai Institute. Finally, we have a nearer hospital with catheter laboratory facility. Cardiologists from any part of the Sri Lanka, please welcome for delivering the free service to poor people. I would like to thank SLMA president because gentlemen made the theme very nice. Excellence, equity, and the community. Thank you very much, sir. Vision to reality, always remember, life may be tough at few points, but this thing is not created by the shoes we wear, but by the steps we take. My sincere thank to, thanks to Dr. Vinay Aryatna, President of Sri Lanka Medical Association, Prof. Kanazingam, Sadhguru Madhusudan Sai, my dear consultants, consultant from Jeffna Grubran and uh, Lakshman, sir, and uh, my director, previous director, and the first cardiologist and 
Dr. Asela Gunavardhana, DGHS, who is supporting us immensely during this situation, and my dear selves. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vinodan. Um, I think it's time for question and answer by the speakers, Dr. Mrs. Penny Jayavardhana, Dr. Ragini, and Doc Dr. Vinodana are here. So if you have any question we can answer. Before that, uh, just Vice Chancellor was telling, at the moment, the Sadhguru Madhusudan Sai is in UK. The purpose is to get fund for Sri Lanka. So he is doing everything silently. He never expect anything from us other than just serve, give our service to the poor people or people of Sri Lanka. So he's at the moment in a mission to get fund for Sri Lanka. So if there are, there are in the audience, there are people who may be your relatives, maybe in UK. So you can link doctors, any health professionals, any service minded people to Sadhguru Madhusan Sai. Either you can contact me or Dr. Ramesh Rao is here. So please uh, help us to help our people. So Dr. Kanta, she is already there are a few people already in touch with uh, Sadhguru Madhusan Sai. I think in few months time, they are going to start cataract surgery with the help of donation from UK. Uh, then uh, Dr. Ashraf, OMF surgeon is going to start some other surgery, OMF related surgery. So with that, uh, I welcome any remarks, comments, and questions to the speakers. I have a request of Dr. Vinodhan. May I speak? Yeah, yeah, please go ahead, uh, Mrs. Uh, Dr. Vinodhan, your presentation was really remarkable on the history of um, the lack of services in the Eastern province. Also that the aspect of uh, immediate care that you brought in with those slides. I think, may I suggest that we do a little education with people, especially in our area. If you can train someone to do that, that'll help. Because um, so little is really known about heart disease. And I think Sadhguru would love to see that presentation. So if you forward it to me, I can forward it to him. Excellent, excellent presentation, Doctor. Thank you. Any comments? Any questions? So with that, uh, we'll close the session. So I'll hand over to Dr. Lahiru. Thank you, sir. Uh, first, first of all, uh, let me thank, uh, before they leave, uh, our esteemed uh, panel from India for providing these services for Sri Lanka on behalf of Sri Lanka Medical Association. Please accept our sincere thanks. Uh, okay, now uh, also I need to uh, emphasize that it's very encouraging to see the efforts uh, from Baticular Medical Association as from consultants in the Baticular Teaching Hospitals, how they have struggled to uh, narrow the gaps in health inequalities for this province. I think uh, this year's team in Sri Lanka Medical Association is uh, one of the themes is equity. So uh, it, your efforts are in line with our team as well and we will provide the uh, maximum support from our end from the uh, as the uh, apex professional body of doctors in Sri Lanka we will provide the uh, maximum support from our end to the uh, to your uh, efforts as well. So now uh, we will be coming to the uh, second part of the uh, session. And in this session, we will be uh, highlighting some of the key issues that has been plagued. Uh, I mean, uh, that has been impacting on the health of uh, 
not only the people in the uh, eastern part of sri lanka as well the entire country for itself so we will be discussing about uh, non communicable diseases as well as some of the uh, global health themes one of be one of which we in the uh, antimicrobial resistance and we will be also discussing about the uh, evidences generated through the uh, primary health care strengthening project as you all know ministry of health and other stakeholders have been piloting and they have been implementing this primary health care strengthening project to uh, strengthen to upgrade and to augment the services of primary health care institutions across sri lanka so to conduct the first uh, session i would like to invite dr kt sundareshan consultant physician from teaching hospital batiklo he will be discussing about debunking fat and carb myths so over to you okay thank you so you, you also can call this topic as how to avoid cardiologist so how to avoid cath lab visit so all my talk is going to be a kind of a evidence based medicine so as you know the evidence can change time to time so i'm not claiming this is the ultimate truth i'm going to tell so it's up to you all to decide i'll give all my talks everything is uh, research based talks okay this is a very important quote by a, a person known as father of evidence based medicine half of what you learn what you learn in medical school will be shown to be either dead wrong or out of date within 5 years of your graduation the trouble is that nobody can tell you which half so that most important thing to learn is how to learn on your own as you all know the non communicable disease the 70% of the death in the world is due to non communicable disease mother of all non communicable disease i will tell i will say diabetes a better term would be insulin resistance the problem is i feel we don't target the right enemy so it's important to understand the root cause of the problem whether it's a cancer or diabetes or fatty liver or alzheimer's dementia the root cause is one you'll understand in a few minutes so understanding the right enemy is very very important we are fighting with the wrong enemy sometime when it come to diabetes we think treating the glucose is the ultimate goal it is not treating the insulin as well i mean reducing the insulin and reducing the glucose is the right um, thing to do you'll understand so so underlying problem for almost all non communicable disease whether cancer asthma diabetes anything the underlying problem is inflammation or heart disease ischemic heart disease due to oxidative stress so the underlying the most important cause of this inflammation and oxidative stress is insulin resistance i'll come to that so when you keep a apple for a while you know it will become brown 
that is oxidation if you keep a iron rod it will, it will be corroded that is oxidation so similarly in the body when there is oxidation happens is oxidative stress we get disease just similar to what happens in apple and the corroded iron what we eat and what we think matters so such as alcohol smoking bad food which can cause oxidation and lead to disease like diabetes cancer ischemic heart disease and so on even aging is due to oxidative stress dementia parkinson's epilepsy stroke arthritis the underlying problem is oxidative stress what is oxidative stress when you lose when you lose uh, you can see that one electron from an atom it will become oxid oxidate it's a it's a very active particle which cause damages so if you give one extra electron to that ion then that will be so that is antioxidant so the the best medicine for an oxidative stress is an uh, antioxidant so this is one example i have given the ischemic heart disease the underlying problem is inflammation now coming back to insulin resistance many of you don't know you think when when it's insulin resistance pain it is that causes diabetes insulin resistance is the cause for many diseases including alzheimer's dementia cancer heart disease diabetes polycystic even a, a low testosterone level in male fatty liver my, migraine everything the underlying problem is insulin resistance how do you get insulin resistance how do you get how do you get antibiotic resistance how do you get nitroglycerin resistant with nitroglycerin it is because of antibiotic it is because of nitroglycerin similarly there are enough evidence to show the insulin resistance is is due to insulin itself or the important cause of insulin resistance insulin when we diagnose diabetes that is too late nearly 10 years before you diagnose as diabetes you have high insulin high insulin itself causes insulin resistance as per this there are many research in in this particular article by american diabetes association says in summary hyperinsulinemia is often both a result and a driver of insulin resistance it's very important to understand now next question is what causes high insulin so high insulin causes insulin resistance at least one of the important cause of insulin resistance insulin itself now remember when you treat a diabetic patient with insulin you do good thing similarly you do bad thing also as well now there are enough link between high insulin and ischemic heart disease it says it is the link is more stronger than ldl now high insulin is associated with three times more cardiac death two times more cancer risk two times more risk of alzheimer's dementia insulin is 40 times increase the risk of ischemic heart disease so in diabetes or any of this disease i mention if you think glucose is a problem you are half our mission will be failed maybe 50% mission failed if you think the insulin also a problem then we'll treat insulin as well as glucose the aim is to reduce both insulin and glucose how do you do that not by giving sulfonylurea in fact i am not telling not to give so that by giving sulfonylurea give give you reduce only glucose how do you reduce the insulin the best way of reducing insulin as well as glucose is low carbohydrate which increases the insulin if you see increase now carbohydrate increase insulin in a significant way but protein and fat will not so now we have enough evidence now before that so how do you know you have insulin resistance one one indirect way of knowing that you have insulin resistance is checking the triglyceride ldl i will say why is almost useless then what is what you call small dense ldl i will come to that but triglyceride versus hdl ratio or triglyceride if it's high most of us are high triglyceride particularly asians indians and sri lankans we have very high triglyceride 
Um, so one way of knowing whether you have insulin resistance is checking your triglyceride. There are, again, the research evidence are there. Oh, triglyceride versus HDL ratio, it should be less than two. So come to fat. There are lots of controversies created around fat. The story starts in 1960s by a bio biochemist called Ansel Keys, a biochemist. He is the one brought that he thought the fat is a cause for ischemic heart disease. And he did a study in seven countries and he proved that fat is a cause for ischemic heart disease. There are lots of controversies around this study. Some argue he had about 21 studies he studied in 21 countries and he cherry picked only a few countries, seven countries and avoided some other countries and proved yes, fat is a cause for heart disease. So the lots of controversies were there. So till 1960, we believe fat as a villain, as a cause for ischemic heart disease. Now I'm going to show several research evidence. Again, as I said, I am showing the research evidence. It's up to you all to decide because research evidence changes. You know with COVID what happened. One day we say this is the best treatment. Next day they'll say this is the worst treatment. So it went on like that. The lots of conspiracy goes on when it comes to researchers by pharmaceutical company, by food industry and so on. So I don't think you should believe what I'm telling, but you should have a very open eye. But what my research evidence, I think almost all these evidence are from well-known top medical journal. Here one evidence sh shows that there's no significant evidence for concluding that dietary sat saturated fat is associated with an increased risk of coronary heart disease or cardiovascular disease. Another uh, research published in British Medical Journal it's a meta-analysis or systematic review and meta-analysis of observational study. There are always limiting facts. So this is from a British medical journal. It says it's a meta-analysis and observational study. Uh, it says saturated fats are not associated with all-cause mortality, cardiovascular disease or coronary heart disease or ischemic stroke or type 2 diabetes. Trans fats as it, if you want one very clear, there's without any controversies, we can say trans fatty acids are really lethal, uh, such as in margarine. I think in America they have banned. So that is very clearly not good for heart. Another study, again, this shows there was a 22% high risk of death for each 0.78 millimole per liter reduction in serum cholesterol. greater reduction in serum cholesterol had a higher rather than lower risk of death. Systematic review and meta-analysis of randomized control trials do not provide support for the tra traditional diet height heart hypothesis. Another study, uh, they replace saturated fatty acid with monounsaturated fatty acid. Again, uh, actually the mortality increases. Sydney Diet Heart Study, a randomized control study, it says substitute dietary linoleic acid, I think it's a monosaturated acid, in place of saturated fats increases the rates of death from all cause coronary heart disease and cardiovascular disease. These findings could have important implications for worldwide dietary advice to substitute omega 6 linoleic acid or polyunsaturated fats in general for saturated fats. Another large study, it shows nearly 48,000 participants, eight years study. So when there's a 10 reduction of fat by 10%, there's an increase, increment of ischemic heart disease by 26%. This is a recent study, uh, one of the largest study done in 18 countries, more than one like people were involved. It shows, look at this. I, I don't know whether you can see. The first one, first four diagrams are for fat. It shows higher the fat, whether saturated, monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, lesser the death. Lesser the, that's as per the research. But if you look at the last one, higher the carbohydrate, higher the mortality. 
the message is very clear again it's a evidence um at least the fat is not bad as we think or maybe good so and carbohydrate definitely not a good diet but again carbohydrate means sugar is a carbohydrate processed food is a processed carbohydrate is a carbohydrate so we don't know what kind of carbohydrate in this research they are talking of so at least the processed carbohydrate is definitely a uh, not a good diet there are two statements given by one of the some of one of the largest studies done on cardiac uh, in the heart framingham study before that uh, one author important author lead lead author of a nurses health study and the health professional follow up study he says we have found virtually no relationship between the percentage of calories from fat and any important health outcome another one of the directors of framingham study he says more saturated fat one ate the more cholesterol one ate the more calories one ate the lower people serum cholesterol this is uh, uh, article in the journal of american college of cardiology i think each and every sentence here are very important i will read for you the recommendation to limit dietary saturated fatty acid intake has preceded despite mounting evidence to the contrary most recent meta analysis of randomized trials and observational studies found no benefit effects of reducing saturated fatty acid intake on cardiovascular disease and total mortality and instead found protective effects against stroke saturated fatty acid increase ldl cholesterol in most individual this is not due to increase level of small dense ldl particle but rather large ldl particle which is which are much less strongly related to cbd risk whole fat dairy unprocessed meat and dark chocolate are saturated fatty acid rich food with a complex matrix that are not associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease so now you know the popular diet paleo diet or ketogenic diet people almost reduce the carbohydrate almost to nil and they take too much of fat and protein people think taking too much of meat may be good and there are good effect i'll show that what i feel is just by removing the ketogenic diet or paleo diet works really well not because you are adding meat or any other protein but by eliminating or reducing the carbohydrate these are some of the results if you see the it reduces the weight significantly without any doubt it increases a good cholesterol hdl it reduces the cholesterol it reduces the ldl triglyceride and blood urea and fasting blood sugar but increases the creatinine a little bit recently i went through a youtube i didn't sorry i couldn't uh, mention here the uh, site very very important uh, message here now you look if you look at this one 2017 2018 2018 and 2022 these are the people uh, 200 if you look at this one at least 224 people uh, undergone a low carbohydrate diet out of that 117 people there were remission that mean no drugs just simply low carbohydrate diet cured or the right term now is remission diabetic remission was observed 52 if you look at in 2020 again 52% out of 203 people in 2019 48% see we are struggling nearly 50 out of 100 nearly 50 people were able to get rid of medicine just simple one medicine low carbohydrate when you give medicine you okay you can reduce the glucose some of them may reduce the insulin resistance but it won't reduce may cholesterol any other thing but low carbohydrate it reduces your diabetes it reduces your cholesterol and so on and cancer risks and so on so one medicine for many diseases it's low carbohydrate it is the way to go i think now people are very reluctant to go for it because we are live with 
twice not only the same study not only uh, diabetes it uh, the low carbohydrate reduces the creatinine if you look at that reduces the creatinine protein urine protein serum cholesterol hdl uh, sorry increase hdl and in reduces the triglyceride not clear so as i said i think we can't blame just carbohydrate if you see the longest living people in the world is one of the areas okinawa in japan one island where they take 80% or 67% of their diet is sweet potato so they are taking unprocessed natural food so it's uh, this is very complex definitely carbohydrate play a major role probably the sugar and the processed carbohydrate is the culprit so these are the people who lives hundreds of years i mean more than 100 years in okinawa because sweet potato has lots of phytonutrients antioxidant next come to ldl controversies um definitely what we see as ldl in lipid profile is not the right thing we do uh, i will tell why there are enough studies to show this is one of the again british medical journal a systematic review shows high ldl cholesterol is inversely inversely associated with mortality in most people over 60 years they say higher the ldl lower the mortality um in more than 60 years why is that we'll come to that now if you look at ldl it's produced by our body with some purpose it's needed but when it combine with a glucose glycated at ldl is lethal oxidized ldl is lethal that is we call that is what we call small dense ldl ldl itself is not bad small dense ldl is bad which we can't do routinely so small dense ldl is atherogenic so when you check ldl we are not checking the right uh, marker so when it's oxidized when the ldl is oxidized it can't be cannot be taken up by the liver or the peripheral tissues so where will that go that will go to the blood vessels and damages the endothelium it goes inside and form the foam cell and atherogenesis i think we should understand very clearly it is a small dense ldl which is bad so we should not blame ldl similarly we should not blame carbohydrate it's probably the processed carbohydrate and sugar we should blame similarly ldl we can't blame ldl but we, what we have to blame is the small dense ldl about statin again again there are maybe studies which may be may contradicting what i am telling this is from again british medical journal they have went through 11 studies more than 93 90000 participants what they have found is how much the statin how much of months or years as statin can increase your life span this is their result when you have a cardiovascular disease it increases the life span by 5.2 days if you don't have a cardiovascular disease increase your life span by 3.1 days so again i am telling this is from a british medical journal in which if you read the discussion they'll say the lots of uh, limitation in the studies also but 5 Five days and three days, maybe some months. We can say it can't be years. So these things we should look into. So if you go by now, when they present the research, we go by risk reduction. That will cheat you. If I say statin has a risk reduction of fifty percent, that means it's like this. After five years, if you give hundred people five years, if you don't give statin, two will die. For an example. if you give statin after 5 years one will die so what is the risk reduction it is 50% it will cheat you when you say 50% it's a huge number but if you say absolute risk reduction it's only one or number needed to treat to give a more meaningful answer so if you see the journal they have studied this also when it come to benefit they talk about risk reduction not absolute risk reduction when it come to side effect of the drug they talk about the absolute risk reduction so number needed to treat if you see for example if you treat heart disease patient 
for 100 people for five years. If we treat 100 people, we can prevent one death. Statin, if you give, if you give 83 people for five years, you can prevent one death. Coronary stent during heart attack, if you do 40 coronary stents, you can prevent one death. But if you give Mediterranean diet, if you give diet, right diet for 30 people, you can prevent one death. So this shows a significant importance of diet in heart disease. So what is the better solution? We talk about fat. It seems it's not too bad other than the trans fatty acid, which is human made. Anything made by human, you must be very careful. Anything processed by human, you must be careful. Natural things are not so. So we said carbohydrate, probably the pro processed carbohydrate is really bad. Fat, it's not bad as we think. Now, what is it? So drugs also, it has its benefit. I do give statin. Somebody asked after my talk whether you prescribe statin. I'm giving, but I'm waiting for the guideline to change. Now, America, things are changing. They have stopped restricting cholesterol and the fat. So what is the best solution? You know the problem is oxidative stress or inflammation. Why? Due to one electron and the free radicals. The best solution would be antioxidant. Where do you get the antioxidant? So you can divide food into two, macronutrient and micronutrient. Carbohydrate, lipid, protein, you know, we have talked about it. The other side is the medicine given by the nature, vitamins, minerals, and phytonutrients. Most of you don't know, most of us, we don't know what is phytonutrients. There are maybe 10, 15 vitamins, 10, 15 minerals, and there are thousands of phytonutrients. It's a nature's medicine antioxidant for most of the disease. I will give one or two example. So what does it do? It give a donate one electron to the affected atom. So, so it's donate, that is antioxidant. I will give one or two very good examples. There are plenty when you give antioxidant, how one way to deal with non-communicable diseases, eliminate the bad thing that itself will heal. Second thing is add the right thing. That's what I'm telling here. This one is the one in the, he is a cardiologist, uh, Professor Dean Onish. He's a cardiothoracic surgeon. I think he's an Olympic medalist, gold medalist. In, so both of them did studies, almost similar study, two different studies. This is their finding. So here, angiogram, they did 32 months of plant-based diet without cholesterol lowering medication showing profound improvement. Angiogram before the diet, after the diet. I think none of the medicine in the world can do it. Maybe statin can do a little bit uh, as per some claim. So this is, I will say miracle. So nobody talks about this medicine, um, but it has shown, but I'm sure people will disregard this saying a small study or that and this, but this, this is one example. And same person he did, uh, he said he gave all plant-based diet to, 18 seriously ill heart patient for 23 years. He's a cardiothoracic surgeon. And uh, there were 49 coronary events during eight years prior to the study. 49 events, zero coronary events during the 12 years of follow-up. After the plant-based diet in invention, there was zero coronary event. Before that, there were 49 coronary events. And only one died of cancer instead of expected death is eight to 10 death due to cancer. This is another study where it shows uh, this is a esophageal cancer cells are there. They gave dried strawberry for three to six months. After I think three or six months, you can see how much of reduction in the cancer cells. That's all my this thing. So in conclusion, I will say inflammation caused by oxidative stress is the underlying problem in many non-communicable diseases. Insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia play a vital role in this disease. The successful treatment of diabetes and many other diseases requires addressing both glucose and insulin level. Saturated fats has not been proven to be harmful and a low fat diet may increase the mortality from ischemic heart disease. In the elderly, LDL cholesterol is inversely related to mortality and is 
small dense LDL particles that are the true atherogenic culprit. Carbohydrates, particularly processed and, and sugary ones, increase all cause mortality. Statins may not only in, uh, may only increase the lifespan by a few days. A diet rich in antioxidant is a powerful medicine. So as I said, I have given all based on evidence. I may be right or wrong, but so there are we have to think twice before uh, prescribing the right medicine. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for this uh, thought-provoking lecture on NCDs. And for the second uh, lecture, I would like to invite Dr. Darshini Murugupille, Medical Officer in Charge, Provincial Training Center, Eastern Province. She will be discussing about the evidences generated through the Primary Healthcare Strengthening Project, where we have generated very interesting uh, evidence that why we should be engaging with the primary health care institutions as well as medical officers of health officers to strengthen the primary health care. Over to you. President uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association, Dr. Vinya Retna, and uh, Dean, uh, Faculty of Healthcare Science, consultants, my dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to you all. I think you all have been sitting since 9 a.m. and uh, it's a bit of a hard task for me to keep you all, uh, uh, to take you all out of your phone and to focus on my lecture. So hope, uh, this would uh, bring an enlightening what's happening in Batiklo because all the statistics and everything we quote from either Western or from the national. So I think uh, it's high time we move on to our own very data set and uh, plan our activities according to that. So this is my small uh, task in that uh, first step. And uh, so when I when they said, let me ask me uh, whether I can do a presentation. So I usually do on communicable disease. So this time, so I was thinking uh, what to talk and even I 
spoke to Dr. Sundaresan. So then I thought it, this topic would be aligned uh, with the morning symposium as well as the fat, the, the one before that you all listen. So is, I mean, are we out of danger? That is, is batic low, uh, are we out of danger from the communicable disease? So these, some of the lessons that we learned from this population screening, I would like to share a very few slides. Right, so I, before I commence, I was, uh, I wanted to uh, quote from a famous a person, a founder of America and a well-known personality, Benjamin Franklin, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So, and the, the president of SLMA is a public health person and I'm also in the field. So hope uh, this presentation would uh, do something better to the particular and uh, so with uh, having said all that, so we will uh, move on to the presentation. So just an introduction on what is PSSP or the Primary Healthcare System Strengthening Project. It's an implemented by Ministry of Health with funding support from the World Bank uh, for providing quality care through primary medical care institutions. So the project aim is that they increase utilization of primary healthcare services with special emphasis on detection and management of non-communicable uh, diseases. So just before, I mean, all this, uh, before this presentation, you were, you were, were all were aware about the cath lab and the importance and everything. But before that, I think we should know what actually our public are going through, right? So uh, our district uh, has the population of nearly 636,000 with 345 GN division. And uh, in that, over 35 population is nearly 115,000. And in the screening of uh, PSSP with the fund, World Bank, uh, World Bank Fund, we have almost screened nearly 57,500 uh, uh, population. That is out of 198 GN division. That is out of 345 GN, we have completed 198 with uh, 57, that is 35 and above population. So these are the areas that uh, <clears throat> the population screening, I mean, uh, we select uh, hospitals and uh, th that hospital staff with the collaboration of the uh, MOH, that is a Medical Officer of Health Office, they do the population screening. So the PSSP project was started in uh, way back in uh, 2018. I was introduced to Sri Lanka and uh, all over the Sri Lanka. And uh, they started this screening project in 2019. So in particular also, we did it in a stepwise manner. So 2019, two hospitals, and then uh, as you all can see, uh, 2022, uh, uh, there were eight hospitals. So out of the 40 uh, primary care institutions, that is divisional hospitals and uh, primary medical care in, uh, institutions, uh, PMCUs, uh, we have screened, we have included in the project around 20 hospitals. So the, the, the this side map shows the locations of the hospital and the screened uh, population. So what store next? The screening are done uh, for the uh, risk behaviors as well as for the pre or the malignant conditions. So they, they do screen for breast, uh, breast cancer, thyroid examination, oral examination, and for the cervical cancer examinations. And, uh, and they assess the risk of uh, consumption of alcohol, to, uh, tobacco smoking, and beetle chewing. And the risk factors screen for uh, elevated blood pressure, blood sugar. Uh, these are two uh, 
uh, investigations from the lab and uh, they measure the BMI and uh, detect the overweight and obesity among those population. So this from this slide onwards, I'll be, uh, I'll be showing the mapping of where the risk in particular district lies. So if you take smoking, uh, actually this, uh, uh, this, these are all percentage. Uh, it was a painstaking <laughs> process for me to map. I mean, the, because uh, the data were do raw and uh, I have to convert into a percentage and then map out in the district map. So if you see smoking, the, the top, the Northern part of Batiklo and the small area of Southern. So if you see the grading, the, from the darker to light, right? So the darker most has the high risk population. So this type of mapping is very essential for us. I mean, we are to target and do our activities or else like Dr. Vinodan said, we have to run behind the cat lab. I mean, we ha I mean uh, uh, like cat lab and the, he, the cardiologist has mentioned like each province need a cath lab. Yes, I also agree. But what about the preventive actions? Right now with the World Bank Fund, we have done these screenings and we have mapped it also. So I think it's high time. We need to do the actions at the preventive level. So this is the mapping of smoking. So then comes the alcohol consumption. Again, certain areas are more highlight. So if you see the Vahare, Kadravali, right? And in the middle, we are the, we are the particular region. And the next higher grade comes in the Mandur, Vellavali area. So we speak about particular district, but actually the problem lies in very few areas, I think where we can tackle and do more preventive actions. If you see the beetle chewing, I mean, the, I think Batiklo has high prevalence of oral cancers and one of the culprit is this. So again, if you see certain parts uh, in the Batiklo, it shows high degree of this uh, risk behavior. And then the, uh, mind it, I didn't, uh, do for all the uh, risk factors and risk behaviors. I just, uh, I just wanted, this is an eye opener presentation. So I just took the most important uh, parameters. So if you see the blood pressure, uh, where the population is having blood pressures, right? It's nearly 43% uh, in the Mirakani uh, PMCU, uh, the, the, the PMCU that covers the Mirakani area has the highest, right? And then Following that, it's where Kaladavala PMCU area, the population, and uh, then the Kiran area, Sandivali. So these are the populations that have high blood pressure. Mind, these are all 35 and above, young, male, female, who has come for the PSSP screening. Okay. So our district, so that's what I, I am asking. Are we out of danger or are, are we in danger? Right? So if you see the blood sugar, again, the same mapping is coming again and again. Right. Then the other overweight problem. nearly like 68% or 69% of people in and around Kaladavale having overweight problem, followed by in the particular Hemoish region and in the Kala region, right? People are becoming more overweight. Right, then the obesity. So, I think it's high time 
we give priority to all these and we do start something. Otherwise, we, we will be just focusing on the national and the international data, and we just talk about theory and theory and go on. And this should be taken up at every forum and in every activity we do that we have to focus on the preventive side. Because the most culprit like high blood pressure, high, high blood sugar, obesity, and the bad behaviors is prevalent in our district. And we always talk about overall as saying Batiglo district. But within that district, I mean, there are certain pockets. We have to take it and we have to do it something. So out of the all screen, screen parameters, I took only uh, five or uh, six uh, categories because it's very difficult for, because I have to convert the raw materials, uh, raw data to uh, this uh, sort of uh, mapping. I think uh, in future we will be doing for the other screened uh, data as well. So with these six parameters, so the risk behavior pattern differ GN to GN, that is Graman and Niladar GN. And that, those should be identified. And if you see those risk behaviors of alcohol consumption and smoking and beetle chewing and all, it's very common in rural community. And uh, according to this data, this uh, risk factor like elevated blood pressure, blood sugar and in more in the urban or more towards the uh, urban community. So this type of uh, risk categorization and where the problem lies, and we should concentrate more. And uh, because our district lacks resource in everywhere, um, in, in every aspect, as whether it's a human resource or a financial aspects, I mean, we lack very uh, this thing. So we can't do it for a whole district. So if we identify this kind of risk, where we are standing and where we should focus, I think we can manage our resource uh, pooled and efficient. So with this uh, mapping, I would like to recommend as the highest professional bodies president is here, that these uh, recommendations when I wrote, uh, actually I was not aware about, about this, this year's uh, uh, SLMS theme, but I, I was glad the theme is incorporated in my uh, recommendations. The equity, the community, and the excellence. So I think the SLMA and the BMA all should, uh, and also the university, and teaching hospitals should collaborate and fight back the innocent people of Batiklo. We have all these problems, not scattered all over the district, but in a certain, certain pocket. I mean, it's, it's very high time the medical faculty and the faculty people and the TH, we, Batiklo should collaborate with the RDHS and do this sort of preventive activities. Otherwise, I mean, it's very good and I, I, I highly appreciate and thank the Sai Sanjeevani Hospital to uh, donate and to start the cath lab. But I don't want a long list for the cath lab for, from this Batic Low people. I mean, we should start somewhere. I mean, we, we should start preventive here because now the RDHS has all the map, I mean, they have already mapped and we know where the problem lies. I mean, we should work, I mean, parallelly, I mean, we, we will do the cath lab work and we, we, we should do the preventive as well from this side. So actually I put my take home message, are we still out of danger or are we in a safe zone? So I, I, I open that question to you all. So you all decide whether the Batiklo district population, are they safe uh, or are they in danger?
So every delaying intervention would lead to a cat catastrophic effects of a uh, non-communicable disease, which will cripple the district in long run. Because as you know, some pockets of the district have very high obesity, uh, overweight, alcohol consumption, and smoking. So I would, uh, so that ends my presentation and I would like to acknowledge uh, RDHS Batiklo for allowing and giving the data to uh, present and uh, do the mapping. And also Dr. Kasturi, uh, planning officer who has collected all these data. And I sincerely thank all the medical officers attached to divisional hospitals and PMCUs and medical officers of health who has done all this tire, tireful effort of screening the population. I mean, population screening is not like screening in a hospital where they come and you do, but here they have to do outreach clinics, go behind them and do all these screening. So I really thank them. And also the ICT officer, I was giving uh, much trouble in this mapping out this whole process. And uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the SLMA and BMA and RDHS collaborative this uh, session, uh, giving a small time for me to uh, enlighten this, what's going on about these NCD risk factors in the district. And uh, finally, so I started with the 17th or 18th century court saying, uh, Prevention is better. Again, we are in 21st century, and the man of 20, uh, 21st century, Bill Gates, says again, treatment without prevention is simply un unsustainable. So century after century, we were, I mean, we are saying prevention is better, prevention is better. But still, we are not, I think we are not giving priority and uh, not giving time and not, I mean, not allocating adequate fund or financial assistance to the prevention. I hope as the president is a uh, community uh, medicine person would give his fullest support to Batiklo uh, to combat this problem. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Darshini. Thank you for highlighting the ground realities. I think we have been uh depended on national statistics for some time and uh, we are taking decisions on national statistics rather than going through the uh, regional uh, variations. Now, you have very correctly highlighted that we need to sort of look into the regional diversities and regional irregularities uh, within uh, provinces and we need to take decisions upon these uh, regional diversities. Thank you for highlighting this and thank you for highlighting the importance of public health as well. And for our last speech, a very important subject, a very important global subject as well. Now, WHO has identified antimicrobial resistance as one of the key health topics for the next five years. So we have our own resource here from the particular region. I would like to invite uh, Dr. Rajivin Francis, uh, Senior Lecturer in Microbiology, Eastern University of Sri Lanka, as well as Honorary Consultant Microbiologist from Teaching Hospital Batiklo to discuss about antimicrobial assistance. Are we capable of resisting it? Madam, over to you. Okay. Um, good afternoon to everyone, and thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, I actually planned it as an interactive session. I had to change the mode because the internet connection has been cut off. Uh, uh, so we will quickly finish those, just 12 slides. So um, start with our laboratory data, our own data here, uh, and we analyzed from 2019, November to December. The blood culture coliforms, they reveal 59% of coliforms resistant to third generation cephalosporins. Those are cefotaxime, ceftriaxone. So main mode of our uh, therapy. So 59% resistance. 46% resistant to even fourth generation cefipime. 
34% of our coliforms produce ESBL and 11% of our blood culture, blood coliforms are resistant to our last resort, meropenem. So as clinicians, how does this data affect you all as clinicians? So we'll, we'll, we'll look at this case. This is the interactive session I wanted to have, but because of the internet connection and the time, we, we won't be able to, it's okay. So it says, uh, if a 65 year old lady with poorly controlled diabetes presents with features of urosepsis, what will we start as an empiric antibiotic therapy? So say we start meropenem considering 34% of the coliforms are ESBL producers, so we start as meropenem. Even we start as meropenem, what can be the possible failure rate even if we start as uh, start meropenem? So when we go, I can't see the move button here. So look at this. So then even if we start meropenem for that patient, 11% of our coliforms are resistant to carbapenems. So then one in 10 patients, we start meropenem might fail, one in 10. So that's some, something uh, uh, significant we have to think, sorry, we have to think of. So that even we start meropenem, 11% failure rate. So now we move on to this case number two. A six-year-old child is brought to a gender practitioner with sore throat and the GP prescribes oral sepixin. It's not uncommon. Does this case contribute to the statistics? That means the statistics I showed here. Does this case, the GP, GP prescribes sepixin to a child with a, a sore throat, does it contribute to these statistics? I don't know whether that's the interactive session, but it's failed. So anyway, it's Yes, the answer is yes. Why it is so? Because if that, this six-year-old child for sore throat, which is a common causative agent, this uh, group A streptococcus, which one we need to treat, but we are uh, hitting heart with third generation keflosporin, this one and only oral option available. And we are exposing that patient's gut flora to this third generation keflosporin promoting beta lactamases, extended beta lactamases in her gut. So, and that way in the community as well. So that's how we see that much of resistance in, in our blood culture isolates. So for that, this is our basic third year medical students and second year nursing period, we need to uh, recall. So in, in general, the bacteria occurs in, say we, we, we now the WHO call it as blue bacteria, that means they are good, uh, that uh, they have the genes which, are, which allow them to be susceptible to antibodies that we give. But in nature, but in nature, in nature we have orange bacteria too. That, that means they, are, they have intrinsically resistance to antibiotics. They have that gene. So when this six-year-old child treated with cefixime for unnecessarily, that blue bacteria in her gut gone off and the, the naturally occurring orange bacteria is there and they do multiply. That is a basic feature of any living organism, any living thing. So they do multiply. And most importantly that we don't do, but the bacteria do, they interchange the genes. So this orange bacteria try to give that orange gene to the blue gene. So at the end of the day, that six-year-old girl will have blue bacteria mixed with orange genes. So then what happens? This is another important uh, picture by CDC to educate um, public or at least healthcare workers. So then they started with, they don't start with hospital. The presentation starts with the, the antibiotics on the top. Yeah, antibiotics on the top. So then they say, John, that is on my right hand. Yeah, that's right. John exposed to antibiotics. How does he expose? In Sri Lanka, over the counter, he can walk into any pharmacy and get antibiotics. Or a GP can prescribe, or we can prescribe. So he can expose to antibiotics. And John stays at home and in the general community, spreads resistant bacteria. Because he is exposed to that group of antibiotics. And he comes, John gets care at a hospital, nursing home or other inpatient care, and he can spread that to the healthcare worker, healthcare environment, or the, let's say, other, other patients. 
and that's how it goes around. On the other hand side, the circle is about antibiotic use in animal husbandry. That also we, we should focus, but we don't have any right to do that because we, we are not doing correct thing for our part. How can we go and correct them? So both cycle contributes to this AMR problem in the community. So with these, with these two basic uh, uh, information, we'll move on to the, the case, continuing the case one. So the patient's blood, the 65 year old lady presents with urosepsis and we started merofenum. Blood culture taken on admission is available on day three. That is the turnaround time of blood culture all over the world, day three and reveals coliforms with susceptibility to captriaxone, coamoxiclav and gentamicin. But it's resistant to ampicillin ciprofloxacin, not uncommon. So the patient is on merofenum and doing well. However, her blood sugar level is still high. So what is the next step in the antibiotic management of this patient? Will we continue meropenem? Will we switch to captraxone? Or will we add the gentamicin? Or will we switch to oral coamoxiclav? So I'm not going to ask, but I'm going to tell the answer. We should switch to ceftriaxone. Right? We should switch to ceftriaxone. Why I'm focusing on that? So our students did a small study last year and found it's not published yet. We will do that. Uh, and they found when we asked directly, will you switch empiric therapy to targeted therapy based on the culture results? 99% of the respondents said yes. When we asked the question switched like this, will you switch uh, um, sorry, uh, empiric therapy to targeted therapy if the patient doing well on empiric therapy, only 1% said yes. Opposite. So we know the theory, but we won't practice because we are scared. Because I, why I put this question here, her blood sugar levels are still high. Then that is the reason clinicians are high, scared. Patient is still immunocompromised. So if I, if I switch to a lower potent antibiotic, my patient will be in danger. No, because we are treating the organism, not treating the patient. So we are treating the organism. So if we continue merofenum, if we continue merofenum, what will happen? We will, we will give that merofenum resistant orange gene to that blue bacteria, which is actually causing UTI in that patient. And we promote that patient to come with another UTI because the blood sugar level is high that we are not controlling good. Come with orange bacteria merofenum resistant again. So we can't do that, that's irrational. We should focus that. So principles of antibiotic therapy, empiric antibiotic therapy. So appropriate antibiotics should be started within the golden hour of diagnosis of sepsis. Life-saving that we should do. The choice of empiric antibiotics should be based on local or national guidelines according to the possible focus of infection. Of course we do, we should know. Appropriate samples, especially blood should be collected. I know with this current context, we rationed blood culture bottles, yeah considering all these facts is still practice whatever possible best practices. Empiric therapy should be reviewed with culture results and should be converted to targeted therapy. So these are the golden rules of empiric antibiotic therapy that we have to practice. So, so another, um, 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 the, that is the, that's what we have discussed, the cefixim prescription on a child, what is the impact uh, that is that patient's blue bacteria in the gut will change into orange blue that is, that is uh, very lethal to the community. So this is to alert, and I'm not sure whether it's clear. This is Dr. Sundaresan's pet topic, gut microbiota, and it's, uh, and it's uh, uh, good and good effect, uh, eff effect on us. So we should protect uh, our gut microbe. It's unique to us. Each and everyone will have a unique gut microbiota. We should protect us. So that message should go to your pa parent, patients when they demand antibiotics. You have to tell that your gut microbiota should be protected. Don't kill them just because of a viral sore throat. Right? That will settle on its own, but you can't create your own gut microbiota. Right. So, so now another, this is the last part of my session. So can you uh, predict our laboratory data? What is the rate of carbapenem resistance in acinostobacter isolated in our ET secretions? ET means endotracheal secretions in our ICUs. I'll tell the answer. It's it's about 80%, 80%, 80% of our vaccinator we isolate in our, from our ICUs are carbapenem resistant. So my question is, 
can be linked to the case too. That means the cefixime prescription to a six-year-old child. Can we blame the GP for that? The answer is no, you can't blame the GP. Acetobacter developing carbapenem resistance in our ICUs, it's our fault. We like it or not, it's our fault. Coliforms we isolate in blood cultures, that is a mixture of community and hospital acquired. Then we can blame the GP. You prescribe cefixime, so I, we get 34% ESBS, right? But we can't blame the GP. You prescribe cefixime, that's why we get 80% of carbapenem resistance in our ICUs. No. Two different two different contributors to the AMR. So we also doing our part uh, compatible to the GP. So what measures are effective to overcome MDROs in ICUs? Uh, sorry, this is the interactive part has uh, missed, right? It's okay. So the what measures, so we should put rational measures. So just because MDR ICU acinetobacter is there, so the surgeons can't demand, put on kefaparazon salbactam, my patient, I operated, uh, uh, for more than six, seven hours, put on kefaparazone salbactam. No, it's irrational. We can't do that. We know the sacinotobacter is around, but we can't put as prophylaxis. Can't do that. Because that will not, will not help us to come out of the problem. That will aggravate it. So the same, the, and another, another, another argument is surgeons that we need to continue the surgical prophylaxis because your ICU is contaminated. Again, Irrational, we like it or not, it's irrational. Because acinetobacter is something, surgical prophylaxis is something, continuing cefiroxime or coamoxicla will not help in combating that acinetobacter. It will just aggravate uh, the spread of orange bacteria in the ICU, that, that's the thing. So these are the points I wanted to discuss, right? But one more thing here, are you aware about aware classification? This WHO's aware classification of antibiotics, that we should be aware of it. So there are access antibiotics, around 48, access antibiotics, like amoxicillin, you might laugh at me. Who will use these things? Of course, those are the access antibiotics. And there are 110, including cefuroxime in watch category. Why? These are certainly in critically important antibiotics, high resistance potential. When we even prescribe cefuroxime, you should think, is it really necessary? We are exposing our gut flora to the cephalosporin, which are life-saving. So reserve antibiotics, there are 22 reserve antibiotics, including polymyxin, tigicycline, but the amount of polymyxin that we are using in the ICU is threatening me. Are we? This is the only one. We can't get tigicycline at this current context. Right. So, so we should be aware of this, aware classification. So the take home message is start empiric antibiotics at appropriate time to save lives. That is our duty. Review empiric therapy, that is our prime duty. Review empiric therapy with cultural results to target it. Otherwise, no point of target starting it, right? Protect our patients' gut microbiota by avoiding unnecessary antibiotic prescription and be aware of the aware classification of antibiotics. And thank you very much for the opportunity. Thanks. Thank you, Madam, for updating about this uh, globally relevant as well as uh, relevant for uh, a topic relevant for Sri Lanka as well. So, if you have any questions uh, about the all three topics, I think this is the time to uh, raise questions. And our eminent panel is also here. If you have any questions, you can raise the questions. Do you think we are under, underutilizing some cheap antibiotic like nitrofen only because when I was in Australia for UTI, it's a trimethoprim. I'm sure none of us and nitrofen is other one. I think we are underutilizing some cheap, very good drugs, antibiotic. I 100%, 200% agree with you, sir, because those are non-profitable non -profitable drugs and they they don't bring it. So nitrofurantin, you may have used in Australia, it's an extended release one, so twice daily dose, very uh, compliant, patient will be very calm. We are having the six hourly dose. By prescribing your patient will not take it. And the patient already have cystitis with uh, abdominal pain and nausea to give a six hourly drug, no one will like it. So that, but we don't have the extended preparation in Sri Lanka, very cheap. We have OS penicillin. Can we imagine penicillin OS, how can it be? The good old drug, OS. 
and in our, in private sector you can't even you can't even the those they don't know even is there a drug existing right? so that is uh, that our college is trying hard uh, to overcome this issue but uh, we are micro people we don't uh, have profitable business like cardiology so no one will like us <laughs> Question: How much? Uh, what is the population we have already? Uh, the study was done in among how many? What is the sample population? Four hundred and this uh, over thirty-five population is around hundred and fifteen thousand. So out of that, uh, we have almost sixty uh, forty-nine point eight percentage covered. So each hospital, I mean, the project is ending in twenty twenty-three. But they will go on uh, doing the screening and uh, the referral. I think uh, I think SLMU should uh, inform all the other district as well to do the mapping and see because this is just uh, I just thought it do it and see whether there is any significance. I think other districts have not uh, mapped it uh, because the project is still going on and it will end by 2023 December. Uh, let me add so one, one of the points that she has raised uh, regarding the risk behaviors. Now, we were in sort of, we were in a idea that uh, the risk behavior of urban people opposed to rural people are high, but I think from this presentation, from for instance, in a particular district, the risk behavior among the rural population is high. That is, I think, a sig yes, I think uh, that's a significant finding that should be communicated to the central level as well, so that during the planning uh, of uh, health interventions that can be uh, capitalized. So it's a very good point that she has highlighted. So it is in urban area. Uh, the non-familiar disease is more common, am I right? And the rural area, the risk behavior is common. But it's a, because uh, actually all the all these uh, PSSP project areas are clustered. And uh, we have only done up to 20 hospitals clustered. So still there are more population. Out of that, we are having this much of high percentage. So I think we will be having more. Frankly, the school population, the sports activities are very much less. I don't, I don't think any proper studies has been so far going on, whether I am not too sure. Current activities are very less. And school children are after hours also there are tuition. So that, that is going to contribute a big difference in a few, few decades. So that we should concentrate and we should encourage school activity and we should do some studies in school children. And we have just pilot few projects we did. There is huge amount of uh, overweight hmm. in children, I think. Uh, PSSC project uh, targets 35 and above. Yeah, old and uh, actually uh, I didn't uh, put the sex uh, male, female, as well as age category, I divided into 10, I mean, 35, uh, 44, then uh, 45, 55, like 10, 10, up to 70. Just because of the time constraint and all, I didn't put all those data. I, mean, I just, this was just an eye opener, like I wanted this audience to t uh, take the message that particular is not safe. There are pockets of uh, this high risk behaviors and things. So, I think a, a very comprehensive presentation, I think uh, RDHS can do it because I am not from the RDHS, but it's very kind of him uh, to allow me to give this presentation. I think they can do it. School children to be involved, but school children yeah. are the ones, future generation. Yes. Something, uh, Dr. Chitra. Thank you for raising questions. Uh, actually, this PSSP very specifically intended uh, with the NCD risk factors and modifications. 
So this is five years uh, project. At the end of the project, uh, probably end of this year, we will have a, a system to assess uh, post uh, project uh, evaluation. So then only uh, everything, we have to do the validation of this data and uh, we, we have to do a lot. This is just to uh, eye opening things. Uh, we have uh, uh, publish it because uh, we, we can't publish uh, this data, it's raw data. And, uh, but uh, we have to do a lot in public health care or primary health care setup rather than the cure things in parallel to the curative sector development. But the investment should be much more uh, towards, uh, it should be towards the public health. Uh, that, that is the message we wanted to register in this forum. So we have a lot of issues, but one by one, we are taking it up. We, we are digging it up. So one day uh, we have to, even uh, Dr. Lahiru was, uh, and sir was uh, talking about the allocations of the funding uh, uh, things. It should be, it can't be a nationalized uh, funding system. So we, we have to discuss more and more. So sometimes we get dengue uh, prevention activities funding during June, July, where that uh, southern part get the raining. So we have to have it uh, mostly towards the uh, end of the year, or the initial part of the year. In itself, district to district, uh, provincial to uh, province, uh, and even within the district, we have a uh, uh, great uh, differences uh, in statistics. So we have to, it should be a very tailor-made uh, packages, but what, what in general, public health should be looked after very well, even from SLMA side, MUC side, and private sector. So we have to go uh, in a systemic way and do uh, invest more in public sector. Uh, compared. I think the financial allocation is like 25 percentage in the public sector and 75 more than 75 percentage to the curatory sector at the moment in a government uh, health ministry setup. It should be reversed. Thank you. Sir. With regard to this uh, antibiotic resistance at large, mm -hmm. I have a question. Uh, how do they dispose uh, this expert medication, expert medicines from the pharmaceutical industry? Whether they, they, they are improperly disposed and maybe exposing the other animals and uh, this uh, fish and all, and, whether, and even plant uses, plant, and whether they are affecting the antibiotic resistance, which is oh. Thank you. Um, so this is an important question, and then uh, it's uh, now the college is working on that, and it has already prepared a guideline on how to dispose this uh, unused, expired medication, and now it's an, uh, uh, um, actually it's with SLMA as well, and now, now it's uh, it's uh, it's an agreement come to an agreement that to uh, get give it to the uh, like cement factory uh, like that to de destroy with high high temperature around 1200 1300 so without disposing into the environment that will be a huge harm uh, that we will promote amr in the in the environment yeah. any other questions before i make some uh, remarks uh, if not, I'll, I'll actually add uh, something to what you said. I think it's a very important, uh, very important question that we have also been raising. Now, you know about the COVID vaccine? No? Expired, uh, I think, uh, three months ago. And uh, especially those vials disposing is a major problem. So they have been actually giving it for, you know, the, when they uh, lay the tar, tar in the roads uh, so they can <laughs> crush and then incorporate but to do that do you know that the health ministry has to pay a huge amount to the to the companies who are doing that and also the same with the cement factory yes yes it's msd msd yeah 
the, there's no it is probably the the uh, roads uh, road yeah in uh, sorry, 2008 and uh, there was a dengue control meeting yeah. the people from epidemiology came and at the time uh, then then i suggested that you know if you use, use the media then they said it's, you know, it's very difficult they are asking for a lot of money and then i said it, it, it is just that different pockets of the same gum and even the private media will be happy that are government themselves also. I think they accept that. They, they, they said they are trying. I, think, I don't know the, my suggestion or something else, but I see it in effect. Right? If, if it's a different pockets of the same government, right? It is easy for the ministers or the secretaries just to show. So let me add on that one in the uh... Now, for, as he uh, so correctly said, for dengue control, now in uh, ports and harbors where we have these fiberglass boats, unused fiberglass boats and all this stuff, that, 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 that has been a national level problem for us at the National Dengue Control Unit as well as Ministry of Health. So I think Dr. Darshini <laughs> will know about that one as well. Now, now we have been, so in the, uh, in the past with the whole SIM company, the cement company, the people uh, who who are willing to destroy their boats and all, they used to take these uh, regiform and fiberglass materials. And through the presidential task force, uh, we are health ministry as well as these uh, environmental ministry are partners. So they, they were sort of piloting this project for some years. And we have been uh, very successful in doing that. But since the financial crisis and all those things, now they have sort of stopped this voluntary service. So they were doing it voluntarily. Now, as uh, Vinyas has said, for, for us to destroy something, we have to pay from the ministry. And so that's, that, that was the uh, challenge. So, I think that's a question, good question, but probably it's not within our the, our immediate. Yeah. I think uh, the, there is an association of uh, clinical pharmacologists. They are very, very well organized now. I think uh, you can also refer. We must be, I think the pharmacologists here are also members. So it's a major issue. So no, no, I completely agree. I completely agree. So uh, this is an issue now. NMR is very weak. You can see if you read the editorial of our newsletter, we have also taken action to uh, you know uh, address some of these irregularities in the NMR also. They do, they are uh, quality control mechanisms are not play, uh, uh, working. The testing is not happening. So we have a serious problem with regard to drug cycle management in Sri Lanka. So we'll definitely uh, bring to the yeah. yeah so uh, correct so even the procurement process now we have we have uh, filed a case slma has filed a case in the human rights commission even with the procurement so we all know that there is a huge there's huge corruption in the whole system not just there, which threatens the lives of the patient. So, if you you will read uh, probably in the in the coming weeks our our case. So, we all need to 
work on those issues while also at the level of prescribing. I think there's a lot that we need to also uh, be practicing, you know, rational prescribing and all that, because there is also, even in a resource constrained environment, uh, there had been studies done where yeah, unnecessary uh, laboratory tests have been ordered and also prescribing. So I think it's a collective responsibility. We have to look at each point where these uh, irregularities are happening. So thank you very much. I just want to uh, thank Dr. Darshani and just at one point, it's about the prevention side of it. So although PSSP project is a project at the moment, we would like that model to be actually incorporated in the health system, the shared cluster model where there is this uh, primary medical care uh, units be linked to uh, a referral system, but not a compulsory referral system. But when the local facilities are really of high quality, people will automatically go there. And now uh, transport uh, cost is also very high. So how can you offer those four very critical tests at low cost or no cost to the population? And then how can you have the best of referral care then we can reduce the number of patients who would require uh, cardiac catheterization or CAB and all that. So, uh, so it's a very uh, good point. It's not that we choose one over the other. I think uh, cath lab is very important for better flow now uh, because there are people who are waiting, but you are very correct that we need to really reduce that number. So it's a gradual process. So let's invest more on the preventive side, but if there's good passionate individuals and organizations, you know, who want to support the ca uh, cardiac uh, cat lab, I think that should also happen, but uh, it should not be over, uh, you know, like uh, if there's a long, uh, uh, large number, and it will also not be able to cope with that. So that's where we need to uh, have that system of primary prevention and the secondary prevention of early detection and also addressing the risk factors. I think that's very important. And you could see how equity is important because you see a lot of variations. So it has to be localized action. Those uh, hospitals where you see the high incidence of uh, those risk factors, prevalence of those risk factors, they need to do a lot of uh, preventive care work. So that's the message. So thank you again uh, for all the, um, uh, the important proposals that we have put forward. And as SLMA, we take them very seriously. Each meeting we are taking notes, they all are recorded. And we will take some of these suggestions to policymakers as well. Thank you very much. Over to you, Lahil. Thank you, sir. So, uh, thank you for all the suggestions and recommendations. And I would like to invite all the doctors as well as our nursing staff is also here. Uh, we will be having our international congress in July. Uh, so, we, we will be accepting abstracts until uh, 31st of this month. So, even your case studies, I think uh, Dr. Darshini has a very good case study, and you can and even the school health, uh, you can have a case study as well. So please submit, then we can sort of expose this uh, wonderful work to other colleagues in the country, as well as the international colleagues as well. So to uh, conduct the final session, uh, and for the vote of thanks, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Livington, Secretary of uh, Particular Medical Association, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Lahiri, for this also. Uh, good afternoon, all of you. Uh, hope you all had a knowledgeable session today. Without taking much time, let's move on to the uh, appreciation time to deliver the certificate of appreciations for the resources. I invite uh, the president of Sri Lanka Medical Association, Dr. Vinya Ariratna. to receive the certificates, certificates of appreciation. I invite uh, a representative from Sri Sai Foundation to receive uh, Mrs. Penny Jayavadana's certificate of appreciation. Dr. Ramesh Rao. Uh, also, Dr. Ragini Pandey's Certificate of Appreciation.
डॉक्टर वाई तय की राजीवन फ्रांसिस डॉक्टर एस विनोदन डॉक्टर के टी सुंदरेशन डॉक्टर दर्शनी मुरुगपिल्ले and from the participants i invite dr g gauri palan to receive the certificate of participation thank you sir and next from the batikula medical association we would like to deliver a token of appreciation to the president and the assistant secretary of the sri lanka medical association to deliver that i would like to invite dr k t sundaresan who coordinated this event and to receive i invite the president of slma dr vinya ariratna and the next token of appreciation is delivered to the assistant secretary of slma dr lahiru kodituaku thank you thank you sir and it's time for the vote of thanks i'm glad here to deliver the vote of thanks on behalf of the batikula medical association first of all i am pleased to thank dr vinya ariratna president of sri lanka medical association thank you so much sir for organizing this event and joining with us today also i would like to thank dr lahiru c kodituaku the assistant secretary of slma for all the work you have done and to make this event a success i know you both have traveled a long distance thank you so much for being with us here today next i would like to thank the vice chancellor of eastern university sri lanka professor v kanagasingam for being with us here today also the dean faculty of health care sciences eastern university sri lanka dr t sadanandan for your presence here today thank you sirs also my gratitude goes to dr ramesh rao and other representatives of sri satya sai karuna nilayam for joining with us today and my sincere thanks goes to the sai foundation for all the services you render to our region especially mrs penny jayawardena for her kind hearted support thank you so much next i would like to thank the president of batiklo medical association dr s branavan for all the guidance and support thank you sir my sincere thanks goes to the director of teaching hospital batikulo dr kalaranjini ganeshalingam for providing this auditorium to conduct this event today and the deputy director dr maithili bathlet for being present with us here today i would like to thank the regional director of health services batikulo dr g sukunan for all the support you provided and for joining with us today thank you sir next my thanks goes to dr k t sundaresan for coordinating today's event thank you so much sir for all the all of your efforts and my sincere thanks goes to the speakers of the day mrs penny jayawardena dr ragini pandey dr vaideki francis dr s vinodan dr k t sundaresan and dr darshini murugapillai thank you all for sharing and educating us sharing the knowledge and educating us today surely we all gained knowledge and updated ourselves please continue your good work thank you all next next i would like to thank all the council members and the members of sri lanka medical association and batiklo medical association for all uh, your support to make this event a success
Also, my thanks goes to the IT support team, without whom today's event would have not been reached virtually. Thank you, Mr. Akhil and Dr. Tilakshan and Mr. Rohan for your support and Mayuran and uh, Mrs. Shanti for all the assistance. At last but not least, thank you all the participants for patiently participating in today's event. Hope you all updated yourself and gained enough knowledge. Thank you all, have a good day. The certificates of participation will be delivered at the entrance and you can collect the lunch packets as well. Thank you so much.